Uh, we have this raft of presentations, six of them, stories of wetlands, birds, forests, and the like. Um, but before we get too far, we should recognize that we are on the lands of the First Nations, uh, lands held in a treaty with the <laughs> the Haudenosaunee, thank you. Um, secondarily, the Huron-Wendat, but the primary treaty is with the Mississaugas of the Credit, who are on a Shinobian background. Uh, and the original lands before these groups were here were a subgroup of these called the Attawandron, the Neutral. Things didn't go so well for them in a period of time, and so the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe dueled for the land with the Mississaugas of the Credit being the landholder at treaty time. And we are on the corner of one of the first treaties. So there is a series of treaties after the War of Independence in the US and those who were with the British in the war were getting out of the US. And so the Anishinaabe, the Mississaugas of the Credit, said, well, we'll make a treaty with you. You people are fleeing, be you First Nations or background of whatever. Here you go, it's called the Between the Lakes Treaty and it's has a corner that goes up to the Grand River just at the corner of the bay, so the outflow. And then it wraps all the way around to London, down to Lake Erie, back to Niagara, and there we are. And that's part of a settlement treaty where that Mississaugas of the Credit welcomes a whole lot of people into this area. What else would I say? Ah, the landscape. Uh, what do we know? Uh, Roughly, the color part in that picture is the Royal Botanical Gardens properties. There's a little valley there that's not. Um, it has, a, it's basically an assembly of a checkerboard of lands that had other histories over time. So, formed in 1941, the Royal Botanical Gardens. Um, a bunch of industrial old abandoned lands were part of it. Some beautiful forested ravines. At the time, a fairly lovely set of wetlands. And then, uh, over the last 80 plus years, a whole bunch of other little pieces have formed what we have today, and there's a few more pieces to go before we're done putting back together things for environmental protection. Um, basic goals, well, we know it's the tip of the lake. The basis of all marvels here is the mass gathering of migratory birds, which still does happen. There's just not quite as many of them, but there's still quite a few, so there's always a bird to be seen. Um, Underwater, it's the shallows where the rivers meet the lake. So it's a fish nursery, and it was one of the fish, first fish sanctuaries on the Great Lakes. Might be the first, actually. 1860s, so even predates Canada Confederation. Um, because of the history of Hamilton and industry and early, early settlement, um, there's a remedial action plan still, which is that's one of the slightly messed up places on the Great Lakes. It's actually one of the most, but it happens to have the Royal Botanical Gardens protected areas associated with it. And it's about water and contaminants and cleaning them up. That is still ongoing and you'll see some process there tonight. That also means at one point when I was young, there really were no wetlands of any consequence. There was little bits. And we have to mesh in the environmental protection with some visitation. And being the unusual set of lands we have, it's full of rare and unusual things. So there's a focus there to make sure, especially the highly regulated unusual things remain. A little overview. So there's an old picture of Coots Paradise Marsh when there wasn't much of it with the forest around it. 1996 on the left. Is that your, that's your right, <laughs> my left. And, um, well, Google Earth keeps adding nifty aerial photos, so I took last falls. Um, it's much more interesting in the lower corner. The water is not beautiful yet, although it's not bad in that picture. And, of course, fall 2022, there wasn't much water out there, so you actually see a bunch of land where there would be water normally. But much different, much improved. Steps to go, though. Um, and as I mentioned, the water went away. There's down by the boathouse, fall, September. And um, we started to realize again how shallow the place was. There's the middle of Coots Paradise, later September. And there's the middle of Coots Paradise. And that's uh, a day where we had a big cleanup of whatever was on the bottom. Picked up cans, plastic bottles, tires, all the good fun. So we're reasonably spick and band span to start another year. Uh, we had some mail outs for you this year on a couple of themes. One is that big forest we have at Coots Paradise, pulling away some of the accumulated invasive species, which are basically woody plants. 
shrubs and roses and things, and uh, one about just endangered habitats and species. So a few highlights, which you'll see a bunch more in the presentation. These are examples of endangered species encountered, the American chestnut up there in the top, a red mulberry tree, of course our most endangered turtle, the Blandnix turtle, and a whole lot of habitat work. The lower picture is a semi-familiar picture to you, but it wouldn't be at the same time. It's by the canal in Dundas, the old ship canal. For 100 years, Phragmites reigned. European introduced Phragmites, and it does not anymore, as per that picture. Um, out in the forest, where is that piece of forest? Am I getting an arrow? No, you won't see it. Look at the map. Look at the map. The place is way back in the woods, so it's a way hike. It's beyond where the trail system goes. Come on, pointer. There we go. So around here, this is where the invasive species work was. There's always stuff along the trails. And so we made heaps, heaps of shrubs, which are now decaying. I can tell you the eagles are nesting, and they sit over top of it in a big pine tree currently, admiring it. And next spring, this spring, well, it's now this spring, things, birds like the wood thrush will hopefully reoccupy something they couldn't have flied through just a year ago. Uh, to make it all work, many financial supporters in 2023, there's the, the list of them up before you on the screen. Many private donors. Uh, and all sorts of engagement with volunteers, summer students, other groups with similar objectives, although in different communities. And of course, many a summer student and a school student doing things on the property. I do want to stop and highlight a thing. I did refer to a spill back there at Shadok in 2018, 17, 16, 15, it turns out 14. Um, work is now proceeding to unravel that tangle. There is an online open house sort of situation for comment. There's an environmental assessment occurring, which is a process when a group goes through to fix a major project, the city of Hamilton. The issue is, of, of the many on Shadow Creek, there is a stream, a branch of Shadow Creek that flows off the escarpment coming out of Iroquois Heights Conservation Area. If you know your locations, it's where the 403 goes up the hill. Um, it goes into the sewers, it goes into the sewer overflow holding tank that is supposed to catch the spills. It fills the tank, and thus the tank doesn't get to catch the spills. We then pipe all that water over to the wastewater treatment plant for treatment. So there is a creek that occupies the sewage business, and the job is to split the creek out, send that water to Coots Paradise, and it's fairly clean water. That's a, a lovely spring-fed creek up there at Iroquois Heights. So the real question for engagement purposes because you've got to split it no matter what, because you don't want to spend money at a wastewater treatment plant treating a creek. Um, is do you want to have an open channel, which would become the first of those restorations in Hamilton, which then becomes a community feature, a flowing stream, or one in a pipe? Those are your choices, really. That's what it boils down to. Anyway, online, city of Hamilton, Ainsley Woods. On with the show. So, here is our list. We are going to start with Things in the Water and Jennifer Bowman. Um, by presenters, just so you understand the mix of them. They all have a background that went to a university and often a college. That might have been the University of Guelph, which was for a long time the kingpin in the biological sciences, Trench University, Toronto University, and even McMaster University, and participating in the Naira College Ecosystem Restoration Program. So that is their background. Jen has been with us the longest of the bunch, starting in 2005, she tells me reminding that's getting on, and uh, she is the aquatic ecologist, thus talking about all things water. Over to you, Jen. Okay, thank you, Tice. So I get to start it off. I have to turn this mic up a little bit here. OK. So um, I am going to start talking about the water, the quality of the water, the quantity of water, and a little bit about the fish populations and the amphibian populations. So the water really determines what kind of year we have in the marsh. So it's pretty important to talk about first. So precipitation this year, Tice already mentioned, we had a bit of a drought. So we didn't have a lot of rain events. 
And when we do our water quality sampling, we either have a dry sample, which is base flow from our creeks, um, or storm water, which is after a storm event. Within 24 hours of sampling, greater than four millimeters of rain. So we only had three of these this year. The largest one was only 17 millimeters, so pretty reasonable. Um, so this is uh, the Lake Ontario water elevation. Um, you can see 2021 plotted here, but the black line is 2022. And we did have more water in the spring. The water level peaked in April, which is actually great for the marsh. That's what we would typically expect. And it started going down over the summer. We had our drought. The water went down quite low, faster than it normally does. So we had large mud flats showing as Tice was highlighting. And, oh, <laughs> um, sorry. Okay, we'll just show the mud flats there. So this is what we had in the marsh. Um, some of the creeks only had a couple inches of water, actually. So it was hard for our salmon to, to get up, but, mm, okay, I'm not sure what's going on with my slides. So um, large mud flats early in the year um, did impact water quality. So when we talk about rain events in the city, um, the first thing I think about is CSOs, so that's combined sewer overflows. So the city of Hamilton is an old city, just like many old cities. That old portion is built with a combined system. So the sewage is mixed with rainwater. So we have rainwater washing off of our houses, down into downspouts, off of the roads, all combines together and gets treated at the wastewater treatment plant. This can be fine on just a regular day, but when we have a big storm, there's too much volume for the wastewater treatment plants to process. So they fill these massive tanks. The city built these underwater, or sorry, underground tanks to hold that excess volume so that they could process it properly at the wastewater treatment plant after the storm. So we track how many overflows happen because sometimes these tanks overflow because they fill up and there's nowhere else for the water to go and it goes untreated into our creeks and that impacts the water quality in the marsh and our creeks, obviously. So this year we had um, 17 events. So these were from our tanks. So we have a tank at Main King, the Royal, and then McMaster. That one flows into Ancaster Creek. Um, and then we have a number of um, locations where sewage can overflow at an uncontrolled site. So it's basically just like a weir and the, the city just models whether it overflows or not. But they can estimate the volume for us. So we end up getting a volume of untreated sewage that would have um, impacted the marsh. This is stormwater and sewage. And we had just over 6,000 cubic meters. So it's not the worst. I, we have seen <laughs> other years that had a lot more than that. So, But it's something to keep in mind when we're looking at our water quality. So our sampling stations, we had 10 total. I'm really only gonna talk about two today. Um, we have an index station for Coots Paradise and one for Grindstone. These are our um, delisting stations for the Hamilton Remedial Action Plan. And these stations are sampled weekly from the beginning of May to the end of September. So we'll start off with water clarity. Water clarity has been historically measured using a Secchi disc. This is like a standard way of measuring clarity. It measures the amount of light penetration into the water. So we actually drop a disc. It's got uh, white and black bars. When you can't see, differentiate between the bars anymore, that's when you know how much light is penetrating, how far the light is penetrating into the, the water. And that impacts fish or the, um, the plant growth in the marsh. So we want to see a higher um, number for our secchi. That denotes clearer water. Our target for coots is 150 centimeters of clarity, and for grindstone, it's 100 centimeters. So I've noted these targets on the, on the map here, or on the, the graph, and you can see that we're not meeting targets. This is the season um, values for the season. Sorry, the blue line is coots paradise, and the green line is grindstone. And that'll be the same for the next slide as well. 
So total phosphorus is a limiting nutrient. So usually when the water gets phosphorus, algae can grow or plants. If you have too much phosphorus, then we get too much algae growth. And we wanna make sure we don't pass that threshold. We wanna grow macrophytes, plants, not algae. Because if we get too much algae, it, uh, sorry, it ends up uh, smothering the plants and that just ruins the marsh habitat because the plants are the basis for the marsh habitat. So again, I have our target plotted here. This is an initial target for the wrap. We're hoping to lower that because less phosphorus means we'll have a better chance of growing our, those plants. <laughs> and again, you can see we're not meeting our targets. The um, phosphorus was elevated for most of the year. We had lower water during the later part of the season, so there was more resuspension from wind and wave action. And uh, that's why there's all these spikes. <clears throat> and phosphorus usually binds to sediment, so it's very closely tied. So now I can show you some long-term trends for, uh, for Secchi. This is um, in Coots Paradise. Samples taken from 1991 to present. It's hard to see any kind of trend, but it has gradually improved a bit. It's a lot of up and down. Um, the largest, or the best story I see from this plot is in 2012, we removed over 8,000 carp from the marsh, and the next year we had plants that grew. And that was the first time I had ever seen that. And possibly Tice saw one, one year <laughs> way back when that happened, but it was quite impressive, and we had a lot of growth, like probably half of the marsh was um, growing submerged aquatic vegetation. And that really held, holds the water still, allows the sediment to settle out and the phosphorus to settle out. And we were able to grow more plants because of that. And this happened for the next few years. So it was a beautiful place. We were so hopeful, but didn't last. So we had our high water years of 2017 and 2019. Those stressed the plants, but really it was 2018 that did it. Um, we had that excess sewage coming into the marsh and we lost everything and we just haven't been able to get back there. So in grindstone, over the years, there hasn't been as much of a trend in Secchi. Um, we don't have carp protection in Carroll's Bay with where this uh, site is located. Uh, the best years that we had were when we had those high water years because the water um, depth was so much greater at the station, so there was less resuspension from the bottom. And so total phosphorus. This trend looks a little bit better for coots. You can see that downward trend towards more present values, especially if you don't look at the last few years. But um, we were doing really good when we were growing those plants. We were meeting targets. Life was good. And in grindstone, not really a trend, it's just kind of up and down. And you can see those two years that I mentioned, the um, high water level years, they were the best years we probably had. And the values were like, there wasn't much spread in the data, so that's a good indication as well. Another way to look at water quality is a water quality index. So it's a way to just kind of summarize all that information into one value. And it's good for reporting to the public because it's an easier way to kind of get an understanding of what the water quality is. And so I've plotted, plotted both of the marshes here. You can see Coots and Grindstone over the years. And we're kind of riding between poor and marginal, <laughs> um, maybe halfway towards decent water. So following the same trend, not good water. I have to highlight Shadow Creek. So this, um, the event that happened in Shadow Creek, really it was 2018 that is the main event, but it was going on from 2014 to 2018, but it really did um, impact the marsh. And I think we're still, still suffering from, from those impacts. And the city is doing a great job at trying to remediate 
um, the damage that was done. Um, so they're doing a lot of measures. They're trying to dredge out any sludge that's remaining. Um, they did some floating wetlands, which is what that photo was I showed you. So the floating wetland was actually great, and I see lots of use for that in other places in the marsh. We just want to make sure it's made of natural material. Um, but that soaks up a lot of the extra phosphorus in the water. And they've done some other measures trying to um, increase spawning habitat for the lily put fish host. And there's also a watershed action plan which is being developed with stakeholders to help um, come up with measures to target uh, a non-point source phosphorus um, our contaminant sources in the watershed. So that's in progress right now. It'll probably take a couple years. Okay, so getting on to fish. Um, this is an image of the Coots Paradise Fishway. This blocks our carp from getting into the marsh. It's key for restoring the marsh. Uh, this year we had 42,000 fish, over 42,000 fish over 16,000 adult um, fish inbound. Oh, sorry. So if we look at the trends over the years, we've uh, been losing fish, actually. So we were seeing fewer adult fish come in. Um, lots of generalist species. We have lots of um, brown bullhead. <laughs> and the carp is the green bar on this um, plot. So you can see the, the carp numbers have gone down. Uh, one interesting thing I noticed is the, the green section of the histogram is goldfish. So at the beginning of the fishway, we didn't have goldfish. And then we started having goldfish show up, and they started becoming more prevalent. And we started managing them in 2017. So we've seen their numbers go down a bit. Hopefully that trend continues. We also monitor fish communities by electrofishing within the marsh. The marsh is a spawning ground and nursery ground for all those, those fish, and we look at the number of young fish that we produce every year to indicate how successful the marsh was. So we had primarily, or the most common fish was bluegill in both systems, and in coots, the next one was white perch, and we had um, spot tail shiners showing up as the next mo most uh, common fish in grindstone. And I've also shown here some, we do uh, pike monitoring for the young of year. That's what you call baby fish that were born that year, young of the year. So we had four that were caught in our traps in coots and two in grindstone. So we have evidence that they were reproducing, which is good. And if you remember the trend that we saw at the fishway with the adult fish, this is kind of mirrored with the young of the year fish. The trend's going down. We're producing better habitat, increasing the habitat quality, but we're not getting the fish. So we're not getting the adult fish and they're not as successful. I'll just end with a little bit on amphibian communities. This is just for frogs and toads. We do this, uh, we get data from our marsh monitoring program, which is led by volunteers. So volunteers will go out three times over the spring and listen to calls and count the calls um, at set stations. We have 24 stations. And I've plotted here the number of, well, there's two numbers here. The green is the average number per site, the average number of amphibians. And then the yellow is the total species per site. So these numbers are not good though. <laughs> we should see a lot more amphibians. but. With all our invasive species management, we've seen a lot of frogs showing up in these sites in more of the meadow marsh areas. And I'm very hopeful that we're gonna start getting lots, lots of frogs showing up. So hopefully we do see the numbers increasing. And that's it. So I can take any questions now. Are we doing questions now or, yes? Okay, does anyone have any questions? There actually are, I'd say bowfin are our most prevalent um, predator. So we've been seeing them, if you look at the number of bowfin that we've been getting at the fishway every year, the numbers have gone up. 
So they're really built for a marsh. They're, they have this long fin that goes along their dorsal and it allows them to swim forward, backward. They just do really well in those shallow waters. And we've found a few pockets where we've found tons of young of year bowfin. So I think the bowfin are able to survive and maybe they're just a little tougher. They've been around since the dinosaurs, so they're pretty tough fish. <laughs> Sorry? It is, it's native fish. So we wanna see native fish, especially our top predators. They maintain some balance and we really need that, some structure to our ecosystem. Any other questions? Yep. Sorry. So I'll repeat the question that online people can hear it as well. The question is, how come there aren't more fish? That's really what it boils know, down to. I know, that's what I'm wondering too. Where are the fish? Because we're doing whatever we can to build habitat. We can't do anything really about the water quality. We get what we get from the watershed. Um, we can do some things to help, kind of help it get out of the marsh quicker after a storm. And we're doing what we can there, but there's so many challenges at the mouth of a river and we're connected to the lake. And if you look at trends elsewhere in the lake, we're losing our fish. Like, they're not doing well. We should be concerned. <laughs> yes? Yeah, we saw just a couple, but the water was just not there for them. You're right. For online people, the salmon were missing. Yes. It's not that the salmon didn't want to swim up there, but they couldn't get to the creek physically because of how little water there was. So they just swam around in a circle downstream. Yeah, these are Pacific salmon and there was only a couple inches of water in a couple spots at both, both systems, Coots and uh, Grindstone. And we did not see very many show up at the fishway. It wasn't uh, that they were blocked at the fishway. Some people seem to think that, but that's not what we're doing. <laughs> yes. Um, it's different every year. It, it is so variable every year, and that's really a deciding factor in what we're, what we're dealing with and how the plants are gonna grow. And like, if you remember 2021, we had a drought in the spring. So the mud flats were exposed in May and seedlings germinated, emergent species, without us having to plant them just on their own. All we had to do was protect them. It was great. So it's good to have variability. And then this year, or last year, sorry, 2022, we had all that water in the spring. That's good for the fish, so, yeah. And for those online, the question was, is there less water over time? Sorry. It comes and goes on a cycle. We've definitely been heading in the dry side of the cycle recently. Um, I'm thrilled that it snowed so much in the last two weeks because there's some water. Mm -hmm. Yes? Absolutely, yes. It does. Fish di are driven by temperature. They don't come in to spawn until their temperature is met, and they don't do, they're not very tolerant of deviations from their temperature. That's why we see a lot of cold water species that are suffering because we get all the sediment coming down from the watershed. It fills up our creeks and our marshes, and then we don't have as much water, and that water heats up. And then those fish, they can't handle that. So. Yeah, that's definitely a concern. Yep, okay. We're gonna close it, but you can hold questions in your mind till the end where we can do them all. Maybe something gels as all of it comes together. Um, it's difficult to pin down the fish situation, but I definitely can say that the early years of the restoration had a heck of a lot more fish than the later years of the restoration, even though everything is in theory better, other than there was that blast of sewage, which was many times the entire volume of Coots Paradise, which means if you were a fish, you had to be far, far away. <laughs> so, next up, we have a young lady who's been working with Jen as an intern. She tells me she has a new job. She's leaving us at the end of this week. So our internship program is working. People are snapping them up. Um, her name is Michaela Ford. She is of the University of Toronto, and she has been enjoying the wilds of RBG, Coots Paradise, the mud, the plants, 
the whole nine yards. She's going to tell us about where we're at with the plants as soon as I figure out where that is. It's Ford. It always throws me off because I, for a long time, drove a Ford Mustang, so that's all I see when I see Ford. 1969, for those of you online. <laughs> then I got married and had kids. <laughs> Thank you for that. Definitely not related to the car company. If I was, I would have a nicer car. Uh, well, oh. thank you. I'm obviously shorter than my colleagues. <laughs> um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Michaela, as uh, Tice mentioned. I'm the aquatic intern here um, in our natural lands department. And tonight, I'll be going through the wetland plant restoration progress. Um, of both Coots Paradise Marsh and Grindstone Creek to uh, see what the plants are doing. So as was mentioned before by my colleagues, this summer we definitely experienced um, a bit of an anomaly in terms of uh, water levels. So this was a combination of not a lot of rain and pretty low lake levels. Um, and it caused us to have not a lot of water in our marsh systems. Um, so this really affected a lot of our restoration work. We weren't able to get around as much. Um, pretty much by the end of the summer, we could only really boat to the fishway and back, and eventually we couldn't even get a canoe through the uh, Spencer Creek Delta. We had to walk. Um, so it definitely affected us getting around and doing a lot of our monitoring work. Um, but most importantly, really, it affected our plants, so both good and bad. Uh, for some of our plants that really um, are floating on the water or living underneath the surface, this wasn't really a good year for them. Uh, so you can see this photo here in Boathouse Bay. These are water lilies. They are supposed to be floating on the water. They are currently growing on a mud flat. So they didn't do um, you know, as well as we were hoping, but um, this was definitely reflective in, in some of our monitoring as well. So I'll, I'll mention this a couple more times. Um, we also saw this in Grindstone as well. Um, you can see at the top here, these uh, two photos are both Pond 1 taken at uh, only a couple months apart. This is that same group of water lilies here and here. So uh, definitely a pretty drastic decrease in water level over the year. Um, and even in Grindstone Creek as well, there was only really a few centimeters of water that was flowing through that creek. So um, yeah, definitely something to just keep in mind as we're you know, interpreting some of these uh, plant results. So overall, how are we doing with plants? When we're looking at uh, trying to evaluate how our plants are doing in the marsh, we're really trying to look at the amount of area that um, plant species in three different categories, how much area they take up in our marshes. So we're really looking at our meadow marsh plants, our emergent plants, and our submergent plants. Now we do assess these plants in different ways, but essentially what we do is we combine those overall areas and get this uh, value for how much area of our marshes are covered in vegetation. So when we're looking at Coots Paradise Marsh, this year we found there was uh, 75.48 oh, 75 hectares of vegetation that was covering Coots Paradise. So this was a slight increase from what we saw last year in 2021. But we are still pretty far away from our target of 230 hectares, which is all the way over here. Um, so overall, we are trending in a slightly positive direction, but uh, we're still pretty far away from where we want to be. This is a little bit similar for uh, Grindstone Creek. So in Grindstone, uh, we had 19 hectares of vegetation cover. This was a little bit of a decrease from 2021 as well. Um, and we really are trying to get to that, four, oh, where is this? that 40 hectare uh, mark, and we're, we're still pretty far behind that. So I did want to go into a little bit more detail about our submergent aquatic plants. This is mostly because of how much they were affected this year uh, with the low water levels. Um, so how, it sounds like it's a little bit of feedback, but anyways. Um, so essentially how we conduct our submergent aquatic plant monitoring is we do surveys two times a year. So our first survey is done in June. This is we consider the early monitoring and our second survey is done uh, in and around August. We consider this late monitoring. We have these transects that are set up in various locations throughout both of our marshes, Coots and Grindstone. Closer to the mic, okay. <laughs> um, 
So we have transects that are set up uh, throughout both of our marshes, um, and they're set up in different areas that are meant to represent different habitat types that we might find um, in both coots and grindstone. And essentially what we do at each of those transects is we throw a quadrat, or this one meter by one meter square, into the water, and we're gonna identify all of the plants that are within that square, and calculate how much of that square they cover. So this gives us um, really an area of how much submergent plants are covering our water surfaces. So when we look at Coots Paradise, this year we found 22.3 uh, hectares of submergent aquatic vegetation. This, over the summer, we did see a decrease of 12 hectares, and this really was driven by that low, uh, low water conditions. So, in our late monitoring, when we went to go out doing monitoring, uh, 13 of our sites were dry, <laughs> so that definitely really affected our numbers. Um, and as you can see, um, and as Jen mentioned earlier, we really uh, still are quite far away from the highs of 2015-2016. Uh, and in that plant community, um, throughout the summer, we did see some uh, a little bit of a shift in the terms of species that we were seeing. So towards the later uh, monitoring, we were seeing more turbidity, um, turbid and nutrient tolerant plants. So things that are floating on the surface and are less affected by um, sediment suspension and, and high nutrient loads. So um, this was a little bit similar in our Grindstone Creek system. So we found uh, six hectares of submergent aquatic vegetation in grindstone at the highest. Um, this was a decrease from 2021. Again, as we are expecting, this is because of the low water years. We weren't able to sample five um, out of the 28 sites. Um, so there was a, about an 11 hectare decrease from, uh, from 2021. So this is uh, pretty substantial. Um, but we did see, you know, white water lily continue to dominate these communities. As you can see, this is uh, Pond 4. It's, it's pretty much completely covered in the, in the further end um, by white water lilies. So one of the ways um, that we contribute to some of our ongoing restoration work is uh, to increase our emergent meadow marsh and submergent plants. Um, so typically this, this is planting plants. You know, we're putting more plants into the ground. So this, our, our planting projects typically happen in combination with other types of projects like invasive species removal or shoreline stabilizations. This year in Coots, we planted a total of 9,669 plants. About half of those were cattails. And we were really focusing a lot of our emergent species, so our cattails, our burrits, um, in the Spencer Creek Delta and the North Shore Oxbow areas. These areas were almost completely mudflat this year, so it was a really great opportunity to take advantage of that. But most of our meadow marsh species, we focused on planting them in the Spencer Creek floodplain, as well as in Hickory Bay. And we did have this year um, a project where we installed some coir logs. So those are these logs up here, these beige logs. Um, and this is to um, help catch sediment and to uh, prevent some shoreline erosion. So I just wanted to highlight, this is our um, Spencer Creek Delta. Um, this year, it really did um, explode with diversity. It, it looks pretty great. As you can see, this is, this is the creek over here. So it was a, it was a complete mud flat, uh, which was really, really great for our plants. Um, and you can't even tell, sort of hidden in here are some of the cattails that we planted earlier on in the season. So they had a, a really great growing season. When we put them in the ground, they were 30 centimeters, and now you can barely distinguish them from the plants behind them. So. Um, this was a really, really great area that um, did well this year. Now on to uh, planting in grindstone. Um, we planted a total of uh, 1,718 plants that we put in the ground this year, uh, with a large focus on our mana grass restoration, uh, specifically around our grindstone oxbow meadow area, uh, and some shoreline stabilization along the um, spent, oh gosh, <laughs> the grindstone creek. Um, we also had some, uh, we rescued some yellow water lilies, or yellow pond lilies, from Upper Long Pond. Um, this is this here. Uh, we're expecting this area to uh, potentially dry out in the next couple years, so we were able to transplant some, um, some lilies from there into Sunfish Pond and Boathouse Bay, again to try to increase our submergent area. We also had a lot of help from volunteers this year, um, particularly from the Bay Area Restoration Council. Um, so they helped us plant nearly all of these plants in grindstone at uh, two separate events. Um, and as well, I, I didn't mention in the other slide, but they came out with us three times in Spencer Creek. 
um, well, in Spencer Creek floodplain as well as in Hickory Meadow. So that was a really great help. Um, uh, another, uh, in addition to planting, we have some ongoing wild rice restoration projects where our goal is to reintroduce southern wild rice. Um, southern wild rice is a native annual wetland species which has been lost from both Coots Paradise and Grindstone Creek since the early 1900s. So historically this plant has been used for uh, both human um, and wildlife food sources. So really uh, this restoration project is focused on southern wild rice, although there is um, one that we know of, population of northern wild rice. Um, most of these reintroduction projects start uh, by creating an enclosure here around an area. Uh, and this protects these young plants from browse from mainly mute swans and geese. And it gives them a chance to mature and reproduce. So we had 13 locations, uh, 13 locations where wild rice was growing in Coots this year, um, including our most successful area, which was in Spencer Creek floodplain. This is me. It's taller than me. I'm not very tall, but these plants were quite large. Uh, and they pretty much quadrupled in size from what they were last year. So they did really, really well. We also had wild rice growing for the first time in Shadoke Bay. Um, which is over here. So we're really hoping that that comes back next year. And I'll, I'll just quickly mention uh, one of the main reasons why we install these enclosures is just how much um, effect mute swans and geese can have on our plants. So this is a photo of a wild rice enclosure up in Upper Paradise. And you can just see how inside this enclosure it's almost 100% covered in aquatic vegetation. And outside it's completely bare, completely mud. So they really can have uh, quite an impact on our uh, on our plants, and so especially for our wild rice, it's, it's important to have that protection. Okay, so wild rice in Pond 4 also did quite well, including, um, or wild rice in Grindstone did, did quite well. Pond 4 was our most successful area. Um, and uh, we also had some growing in grind, the Grindstone Oxbow as well as the Pond 2. Okay, I'll Speed, speed this up a little bit. <laughs> um, so another aspect of our plant restoration involves managing invasive species. So one of our uh, big species that we look to manage is uh, Phragmites australis, or Phragmites. Um, so this year in Coots Paradise, we visited 152 stands. We managed those stands. Uh, luckily, 92 of them had zero Phragmites growth. And although we did have a pretty big stem count, uh, a large portion of this was, pretty, was based in two small stands, new stands that we found over here. Um, so other than those stands, um, the stem count is, is really pretty low. In Grindstone Creek, we managed 44 stands, so almost half of these had zero growth. And again, just like Coots Paradise, although the stem count might seem quite large, three quarters of that was based on one, um, one stand. Um, so overall, we do continue to see great success from our management. And you can actually see this from space, <laughs> which is pretty cool. So these are some uh, images that I put together from Google Earth. Um, this, oh, it's a little bit hard to see in this lighting, but um, this photo up here is from 2013, prior to management. So these blue-green blobs are actually stands of Phragmites. And you can see in 2015, as management has occurred, these lines are essentially marks from where staff has been going into those stands to treat, the, um, to treat those frag. And in 2022, you can not see any of the, that frag from space anymore and instead can see cattails re, uh, regrowing in the area. So that's, that's been pretty successful and pretty awesome to see from space. Okay, so another uh, major invasive species that we do look to manage is um, Glycera maxima or in, uh, European managrass. In Grindstone, we managed 2.7 hectares. So because of this low water conditions, we were actually able to get to areas that are usually underwater. So this year, we really focused on the Grindstone Oxbow, which is in the fall when we do our spring, usually filled with water and was completely dry this year. This is the Oxbow here. <laughs> so it was completely dry. So we really were able to take advantage of, um, of that and really focus our efforts there. In Coots Paradise, we managed 33.9 hectares. Um, again, really trying to take advantage of those dry conditions. And really one of our major focuses was the Spencer Creek floodplain. Oh gosh. Um, so the Spencer Creek floodplain is located there on that circle on the western end of Coots Paradise. Um, it's one of the highest quality wetland habitats that we have in Coots. Uh, so restoration work is very critical for this area. This is what it looked like in 2019 prior to any management. It's pretty much a sea of manna grass. As far as you can see, it's green, it's manna. 
2019 was the first of four years that it was managed. This is sort of what it looks like afterwards once it's been sprayed. You can really get a better idea of how far um, those stands can go. And it pretty much nothing is there because nothing else was there other than mana. This is what it looks like now. So after we were able to manage this area, go in, plant some things, spread some seed, uh, and natural regeneration has, has taken its course, it really has exploded um, and has drastically changed from 2019. It pretty much looks like a, a completely different place. So um, has definitely been extremely sex successful managing mana grass in this area. Part of my project this year was to try to quantify just how much this area has changed since um, mana has been managed. So essentially we were just focusing on that meadow marsh area. We established three different zones which pretty much represented different um, extents to which these, area ha these areas have been treated. So some areas have been treated for four years, some have only been treated for one. And we set up quadrats just like the uh, submergent monitoring. We set up these square quadrats uh, within these zones and we counted and ID'd all of the species within this square. This sort of gave us a general idea of what sort of species were out there and how abundant they were. In 2010, the last time um, species were a uh, species inventory was really made of this area, there was only six species that they found. Most of them were non-native, and obviously the most dominant one was managrass. Through our surveys this year, we found 42 species, most of which were native. And although managrass was still um, abundant, you can clearly see how much more diversity is coming back into these areas through our management. And this was really an underestimate of the species. Um, there was really other ones that we were able to find that were not um, really within our quadrat. So definitely a, a very, very successful example of, of how management can, um, can really benefit an area. And thank you, that's all. Any questions? Yeah. Any questions, and I'll repeat them. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what is the chemical used on the grass, mm -hmm. the European and Phragmites? Yeah, so we use um, glyphosate, which is in, uh, oh gosh, I'm going to forget the name now. Many products, but Roundup. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, WeatherMax Pro. What is it? Yeah. I... <laughs> no, so this particular herbicide that we use is only going to affect the plants. So essentially the plants take it up. It affects how they, um, I think it's, oh gosh, now I'm blanking now, Alex. <laughs> it essentially, it, it doesn't affect us. We don't have the, the proteins that it, that it takes up. Um, and it will only affect plants that it's sprayed on. It doesn't affect humans, and after 30 minutes, um, it's pretty much um, taken up fully by the plants. And on the no concerns, it's a yes, no. Um, it's basically a choice between no way you can deal with that plant because its energy is in its roots, and it comes up and it runs as a runner, and so unless you're gonna extract the entire back of the marsh, you cannot remove that plant, and so you need something that is basically going to be pulled into the root system to end the energy storage transfer. Um, it's a short, it's the most benign of all your choices. It's obviously still glyphosate. It is what it is. Any other questions? Plants are fun. <laughs> <laughs> How do we keep the? Mm -hmm. How do we keep from getting sucked into the mud? We can't. Uh, we do get sucked into the mud. Um, the, I mean, we are wearing waders, so that helps us not get muddy. Um, but yeah, it's it's just <laughs> it's just a matter of uh, a, a ver there's a very specific technique of pulling your foot out of the mud, um, and especially like when we had to cross the Spencer Creek mouth. Um, how having a canoe helps because you can really put your weight on the on the canoe and pull yourself out of the mud. But yeah, there's there's no way you get sucked into the mud. <laughs> it's a minor screening criteria at the job interview yeah. stage. <laughs> Do you 
So European managrass um, originated in Eurasia. So it initially was brought over to be um, like fodder crop to feed cows, um, but it actually is not good for that. <laughs> um, there's essentially the, uh, a chemical that's that's in managrass that can harm um, cows, um, which is what it was originally brought here for. Um, so that's where it was initially from. Phragmites, I'm a little bit less familiar with. The history yeah. of Phragmites, well, Phragmites is as a species across the entire globe. There are subspecies to various locations. There is a North American, there is a Canadian version. There are, it's a much smaller plant, not one to the top of the screen. And um, probably by pure accident, part of shipping things back and forth, and of course the Great Lakes, great shipping ports, Hamilton, great shipping port. Some of the earliest records of Phragmites not from this continent come from Dundas along the Ship Canal, which actually I had a picture of that. Um, the Man of Grass also, there is a theory that the Dundas Canal is the introduction point to North America for that plant as well, which gets to the history <laughs> of our location and its connection to the world. Okay, I think okay. we'll wrap it up. Thank Our you. Our guide at the back says, move along. <laughs> Thank you, Michaela. Lovely job. Lovely job. We have one more before we take a break. Um, overall, slowly growing some plants. This is what I think. I think it's going to be amazing this year. Out there for part of the area. Smaller parts were amazing last year. This year, I feel like we're in good shape. Could always be destroyed by a giant tornado rainstorm, of course, but... We shall see, I'm feeling good. Next up, we have a sort of tag team project with Sarah Riche, who is by title, Species at Risk, which means super rare things and where are they? And her intern for the year, Lauren Craig. Sarah's been with us since 2017, 16, I thought it might be the fall, 16. And um, well, there's many of these kinds of things around the property in the end, they need their habitat, but where are they is the question. And on the most endangered category, where are we going? I wonder if I can borrow your microphones that both Laura and I have one? Yep. Awesome. Thank you. And I hope she's not getting any feedback there. I'll, <laughs> I like to wander a bit when I walk because I get a little nervous, so this will help keep me calm. Uh, hello, my name is Sarah Riche. I'm the Species at Risk Biologist here at the RBG. I'm Lauren Craig, I'm her intern for this year. And I know that you're all here to listen to the turtles because that is technically what the title slide said. Um, I will have at least one, possibly two slides uh, <laughs> at the beginning. Just to remind everybody that uh, here at RBG, we actually have hosted up to 60 species at risk within the last 20 years. Some of those are migratory, some of those are extremely hard to find, and a great number of them are also resident in that they are here year round, such as turtles, such as some fish, such as the majority of the plants. And as well as there being 60 species at risk that have been recorded here in the last 20 years. That also includes, uh, sorry, RBG also hosts listed designated critical habitat for a dozen of those species. And that's a legal designation that means that we host a nationally or pr provincially or nationally significant population of those species, which means that our management responsibility is fairly high. Um, and one of those species, of course, is the fern-leaved yellow false foxglove. We found a new site this year. Uh, RBG actually hosts two of the country's six subpopulations of this plant, so we host one-third of the country's subpopulations. So it's pretty important that we pay attention to that plant. Um, we are also the only place in the country where few-flowered club rush, or what we call trichophorum, because trichophorum planifolium, but Latin names are boring, and uh, we are the only place in the country where that grows. It also used to grow at what is now the uh, Rouge uh, Urban National Park. They only had one clump and it has since disappeared. So again, very high management responsibility. What we do and don't do does make a difference. Uh, we, are also, we also host the uh, nationally significant population of endangered red mulberry. There's about 200 to 220 estimated specimens of that species left. And here at RBG, we host about 80 to 85 of those. Uh, this, of course, we are also the only spot on the entire north shore of Lake Ontario 
where there are any nesting bald eagles. We have the only pair. That is on the entire North Shore of Lake Ontario. Uh, in 2022, they fledged two eaglets, and I'm hoping that they'll be as successful this year. Uh, we also have done a the very scientific measurement of a metric crap ton of invasive <laughs> species removal from a lot of that critical habitat. Okay, so now we're gonna get into what you all obviously came here for, which is the turtles. Uh, I'll start you off by talking a little bit about the protections that we have uh, given them this year. We have rescued 235 turtles from unsafe areas. The majority of those are gonna be parking lots, roadways, service roads, things like that. Um, Sarah and I would love to take credit for all those, but sadly, the numbers tell us that that's not true. Uh, about 70% of the rescues that happened this year were first reported or even rescued by people who are not part of this team. So that includes other RBG staff who are here today, definitely. Uh, it includes RBG volunteers, community members, all sorts of people have gotten involved to help us protect these turtles. If you look at just adult turtles as well, the number's even higher, 80%. 0.5% of them that were rescued from unsafe areas were rescued not by me and Sarah. Uh, so we do do a lot, but it really helps to have other people getting involved. Uh, we also benefit from having Dundas Turtle Watch. That is a volunteer organization in the area. Uh, they managed to save an additional 52 turtles from unsafe areas this year, which is very exciting. In addition to that, we do also do nest protection. This year, we actually set a record for RBG. We protected 70 nests. Very, very exciting. Again, most of them not because of me and Sarah. Uh, about 80% of those were reported to us by people outside of our group, uh, which means that if it was just up to me and Sarah, we would have protected 14 nests this year, which is a little bit less impressive than the 70. Uh, and then again, we have Dundas Turtle Watch as well. They protected an additional 49 nests this year, which is really, really great. So basically what we're saying is we cannot over, overstate uh, the help that we get from other people and how much that impacts the turtle population here at RBG. And I'm including this slide because I want everyone to take note that this is not something that is happening far away. This is happening right here in our nation's capital. There, I don't know if any of you might have seen this article posted uh, back in May of 2022. Uh, Canada is a community just outside of Ottawa, and there is a population of Blanding's turtles there that have been being studied, and over the last 10 years, they fell from 81 to 25. That is not a sustainable rate of loss. That population is done for, unless there is significant intervention. And I'm in including this slide because I want everybody to pay attention that we get to do work that helps this. Unfortunately, we can't help the uh, Canada population, but yeah, you will note we actually have about 25 Blanding's turtles left here in Coots. So our population is teetering on the brink of extirpation, but I feel so very fortunate that I get to work at a place that is supported by people like you, and you are supporting work that is being done to help slow, stop, and even reverse that population decline because as you know, ex extinction is a series of extirpations. Extirpation is when something gets removed from an area, like from, you could have something disappear from Ontario but still exist elsewhere in Canada. You can have something disappear from Canada but still exist in the States. But extinction happens from extirpations happening all over. And then you reach that tipping point and you can't get past that. So here at RBG, we have such good news to report this year. I am stoked about it <laughs> because as, horrifyingly sad as this is we have better news <laughs> so this year we actually have another record for you we are now tracking eight adult female blandings turtles so this year we added an additional one last year we had found an additional one uh, so right now we currently have only one in coots which is unfortunate that's seneca but we do now have seven that we know of in hendry valley those are jenny who we found this year emily lola Olive, Mika, who was found last year, and then Callie and Carmen, uh, who we did know of, they actually dropped their trackers back in 2020 first year. to make life difficult. Um, but thankfully, we were, we were able to relocate them this year and stick some trackers back on them. So we're back up to eight, very exciting. Uh, because we were able to track all of those turtles this year, we have gotten uh, three Blanding's turtles nests. We were able to protect three of them this year, which was great. 
uh, a few little fun tidbits for you of the challenges that we face while we're doing that. I would like it to be known that I did not write this slide. Uh, I very bravely protected a turtle nest from a skunk this year. That was brave. I, I would have run. I would have run. Um, <laughs> Serena, Serena, who was our summer student this year, actually stayed up until 4.30 in the morning waiting for one of our turtles to nest. That is the latest that any of us have ever had to stay up to do that. It worked. She got the eggs. Yes. <laughs> and then Sarah uh, waited very patiently, maybe not that patiently, for four days uh, while Lola, one of our girls, wandered around on land waiting, trying to find a place to nest. So very time consuming, lots of things going into it, um, which is why we were really, really happy this year to get a summer student to help us out because that's not always something that we get to happen. It's actually the first year that I've had any assistance beyond one person. My predecessor wasn't fortunate enough to get a summer student or, in, or wasn't fortunate enough to get an intern, but I, I've lucked out. So one of my top highlights this year, one of the, the SAR team's natural lands top highlights this year is that we were able to release the very first head started juvenile Blandings turtles. So the head starting is when we take uh, hatchlings from eggs that we have retrieved from nests. Uh, and we send them off to people who know what they're doing, which in, in that particular case is not me. We need people who know about animal husbandry and they look after those hatchlings for us for two years. And because those hatchlings do not uh, spend the winter hibernating and not growing. They're kept indoors where they are fed and pampered for the first two years of their life, which beefs up their growth rate such that by the time they are released two years later, they're about the size of a four, year, four to five year old turtle. That would have taken about four to five years for that turtle to reach that size in the wild. And that greatly increases the chances of their survival. Now, we were able this year to send five turtles, uh, five hatchlings of Blanding's turtles off to a, another I don't, I'm saying this year, I mean last year in 2022, uh, sending them off for a two-year head starting program. Uh, although we only had, uh, bewilderingly, only five Blanding's turtle hatchlings out of three nests that totaled 36 eggs. Uh, there were a lot of eggs that just didn't develop anything, which means they were unfertilized. Not sure why. There's a, we already know there are plenty of guys available for those ladies to, you know, introduce themselves to, uh, but uh, this year the, a, a massive coup was being able to release the four survivors from two clutches that were collected in the year 2020, and I'm looking forward to releasing a bunch of babies this year in August of 2023. So on the left here we have Nigani, which means uh, he or she goes forward, and we have the to those top four turtles there, the ones on, the three smaller ones on the right are all the, these are all the same age turtles. They just, the three on the right came from one mom and the one on the left came from a different mother. Uh, it really goes to show the effect of genes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so to keep the good news going, we uh, also this year incredibly found six new Blandings turtles, which is ridiculous. We would have been pretty excited if we had found one new Blandings turtle. So six blew that out of the water. Uh, five of them are juveniles. First one that we found is named Etta we actually were able to use some very unique deformities on her shell to trace her back to a nest that got protected back in 2012. Uh, so we know that she's about 10 years old now. She was actually hand captured by one of Sarah's old interns, Gabby Zagorski, who came out volunteering with us one day. That was very exciting. Uh, then we found three other ones. We found Chip, Odyssey, and Bamapi. Uh, we found them all while we were doing some trapping efforts in Hendry Valley. Uh, funny enough, Odyssey was not actually in one of our traps. She was on top of the trap. Don't really know why she was hanging out there, but we appreciate it. Uh, and then the last one that we found was Claude. That was a little bit later on in the year. One of our camp staff actually found Claude up on land, gave us a call, and we rushed down there to find him. So that was really, really exciting for us to see all of those new turtles. This sign of recruitment was really encouraging for us. Um, we also incredibly found a new young adult female Blandings turtle. Uh, our summer student, Serena, you can actually see her in the bottom of the screen there, basically dove head first out of our canoe uh, to catch Jenny, which was incredible, it was very impressive. Worth it. Yes, 100% worth it. Uh, we were really, really excited about this this year. We do wanna make note that just because we have found these six new ones, that doesn't mean that our population is suddenly skyrocketing. Um, doesn't mean that they're no, no longer in need of protection. If anything, it goes to show what we're doing is working and that we need to continue doing what we're doing. And I'll have to quickly zoom through the next slide, oh, yes. but uh, do I hit down? We found, this was also a 
such a high. It was like better than any drug. We found the first eastern musk turtle that has been found, found at RBG since 2009. This was an adult male. Uh, the last one that was seen in 2009 was also an adult male, and similar to the one found this year, was also found at the Fishway, uh, which is such a... I'm stymied about how it happened because they're small enough to fit through the fishway gates. Uh, that one was found by one of our biotechs, Andy, who happened to be taking a closer peek into one of the baskets. Uh, we were able to get a tag on him that we borrowed from a very gracious staff member at the Toronto Zoo, uh, Donnell Gasparini. And if anyone sees him, please let me know because we can't find him. Uh, he's, he's found a, a fantastic hiding spot and hopefully we will be able to relocate him because hopefully he is still somewhere in the marsh. Fingers crossed. All right, so we just want to highlight some of the other work that we did this year. We did do a lot of fencing work. Uh, so we completed an additional 495 meters of turtle and small animal roadkill mitigation fencing. Uh, in a lot of cases, that was a continuation of projects that have been happening over 2020 and 2021. So we set up some fencing at the Esso along Plains Road. We set up some along Cherry Hill Gate and Hendry Park, and then some along the north side of Coots Paradise. Uh, we want to take this opportunity as well just to make mention of the biotechs that work at RBG. Uh, they do a ton of ton of work to help us install that fence because Sarah and I do not know the most about it, or at least didn't before this year. So their help was very much appreciated. So we want to tell you a little bit about the notching that we do with the turtles. This is to help keep track of them. Since we can't put a tracker on all of them, that would be very expensive. So on a turtle shell, you have the top shell there. All the little individual segments are called scoots. The marginal scoots, which you can see on the slide there, they're all highlighted in orange. Those are the ones that go along the edge of the shell. The system that we use is the North American method. Essentially, each marginal scoot is given a letter value. So you start at A on the very right side, go down to L, and then N on the very left side, and go down to Y. That's because most turtles have 12 marginal scoots. You do see some that have more, which is why we save M and Z in case they have a 13th one. So basically what we do is you notch those, you use a little metal file, make a notch in there. That gives them a unique code that you can then keep track of. So if you find them in later years, you'll be able to tell, oh, it's this turtle, there you go. And we actually have been able to do a lot of that this year and kind of see the movements that some of our turtles have been making, which is really, really cool. And some of, some of the data that we have retrieved from that notching information, uh, for example, we have found ones that were first notched in Pond 4, and they showed up over at Unsworth. Or they, like this year, there was a little painted turtle female who was notched just outside of the reflecting pool in the Rose Garden, and was rescued off of the road over on Botanical Drive, just west of the main center. So she miraculously survived a road crossing, which really highlighted the need for some uh, roadkill mitigation fencing there. There was a snapping turtle that was recorded in Pond 4, or what's also referred to as South Pasture Swamp, and then two weeks later showed up over by the Lake and Garden as well. And not just the big snapping turtles, even the little guys are in on it. We have a painted turtle female who, Q, she was notched in Pond 4, uh, or South Pasture Swamp, June 2019, three years later, also showed up nesting at the Lake and Garden. There was also, uh, it doesn't only let us know where they're going, it also shows us you know, where they end up, sadly, uh, such as this one that was found nesting in the Lake and Garden in 2019, it was found uh, dead, killed by uh, improperly discarded fishing line down further in Valian. And just this past year, um, right in December, I think, Lauren here and Brianne came across the remains of a uh, snapping turtle, the skeletal remains, it was all still together. Uh, we puzzled it together and were able to determine that th due to the notches that were still visible on the remains, uh, that was a male that had one eye that had been trapped back in 2012 and 10 years later showed up on the North Shore of West Pond. I can't imagine what may, would have made him want to leave Shadok Bay. <clears throat> uh, <laughs> I, I can't prove it's because of the sewage, but I can say that he wanders. Um, and then of course also there was Sweet Shimmy. You might have also seen a story about this fellow in the CBC News. Um, his notches and other unique features told us that he was actually kidnapped by someone, we don't know who, uh, from the Long Point wetlands and released somewhere between 2007 and 2012 because he was then found here in 2012 by a volunteer, Catherine Schimmel. So clearly, since he only had two legs because the other two had been chewed off, he did not walk here. That was someone who thought they were helping or stole a turtle from the wild and realized, oh no, it's illegal to keep an endangered species and then released it into a nearby wetland. So we, we hope if there's anyone here who runs into that person, can you give them a talking to. We prefer <laughs> that folks not relocate turtles. Of course, feel free to relocate them if they are 
you know, from, off, off, from the road to off the road if it's safe for you to do so, but not to different wetlands. We also wanted to throw some sunshine in the way of our amazing volunteer base because the volunteers here at RBG, we would not run without them. I don't know if there's any, actually I do see some volunteers that I recognize in the audience. So massive shout, shout outs to you. There's so much work that RBG in general and the SAR team specifically that we would not be able to complete if it wasn't for your help and support. For example, you help us with shoreline cleanups and as you can see, removing garbage from the shoreline and you're literally saving wildlife lives, you are improving habitat. We had uh, John Hall and Fiona Morrison as well as, and John Hall's son took time out of their day for free to make a place better on the earth, which is fantastic. And Fiona, I'm sorry, we keep ruining your pants every time you come out to help. <laughs> Uh, we also have volunteers come out to help us with night tracking a lot, really helpful, it makes the whole process safer for us because we have somebody out to help us out. We also have a, an extra set of eyes, which is always good. Uh, volunteers came out this year and actually helped us find Carmen, who was one of the girls that had dropped her tracker. We had people keeping an eye out for that turtle, and we actually found her, I think like two or three days before she ended up nesting, and we were able to protect that nest this year. So very much goes to show the benefit that they do for us. Uh, in addition to that, we have some volunteers that go out and deliver pamphlets for us, kind of educating the general public about uh, turtles and what we do here at RBG. That has definitely led to an increase in rescues and nests protected. Uh, we had another Blandings turtle this year that got reported to us. It was in somebody's driveway and we were able to go over and uh, make sure everything was okay there. Uh, one of my favorite projects from this past year was how helpful these volunteers were for a site of a uh, roadkill mortality hotspot uh, just by the Esso just down the road here. Thanks to the uh, Conservation Halton's Water Quality Habitat Improvement Program, or WQIP, as well as amazing volunteers that came out to dig a uh, suitably sized trench. Uh, I want you all to look at the little red dots. Those are all turtle observations from turtles that have been killed, injured, and I think two of those dots were actually rescues. Uh, just in the last four years, 2019 to 2022. So now that the fencing is up, that is what I expect to have happen. And I'm looking forward to recording absolutely no dead things in that area going forward. So that uh, volunteers help make that happen. Mm -hmm. So thank you. And if anyone uh, ever wants to find ways to help us, you can also feel free to donate to our <laughs> funders and partners who then turn around and help us with that sort of thing. Everything from funding programs like the Habitat Stewardship Program and the Canada Summer Jobs Program uh, the, and to private donors like Cam Hunter and uh, Scales Nature Park who assisted us with so much this year. Thank you. Who first? <laughs> Let's go you, you're in the front. Yeah, I, I just, um, I really love what you're doing, and I love your engagement with nature, and I think it's absolutely wonderful. Um, the Greenland Coalition is really helpful, and I think um, there's a fabulous collaboration with Australia, and the trade actually like has one podium that goes over the highway. Oh, because the crabs so climb. For sure. So the question is, are there, are we looking into any options for eco corridors to help the turtles and other wildlife move across these streets more easily? Um, and what might be some of the kind of barriers to that in terms of bylaws? Uh, the answer, answers to that <laughs> would, I, I could fill up another several hours of, of that. And, and I talk a lot and that's, so that, that's saying something. The, um, there is a lot involved in the corridors. There's some people that will want corridors to be built over the land. You can see some areas with examples of that uh, south of between the Sudbury and Perry Sound. There's one around the French River area, and that's a very large overpass that was meant to be very all-encompassing to different sizes of wildlife. Uh, currently around RBG, uh, at least immediately around RBG, and I do know of another few other spots uh, throughout Ontario where people are taking advantage of already existing infrastructure that is beneath the roads so that no further uh, things need to be built. They'll take advantage of things like bridges or culverts uh, and guidance fencing when suitably uh, deployed can help guide and force animals to use those 
those access paths underneath the road so that they can safely move from point A to B because you are right, uh, animals, when they wanna move from point A to B, especially the pregnant ones, do not get in their way. They wanna go there, so you'd better let them. But um, just putting up a fence, of course, doesn't stop it. All that generally does is make them keep going, keep going along that fence until they find a way through. Currently, uh, there's some corridor, uh, infrastructure corridors that we're taking advantage of along Coots Drive. There's the Desjardins Canal uh, and a culvert that goes under the road there. There is uh, the Spencer Creek Bridge, which no culvert there. That's just a, a massive bridge and anything of any size can, uh, any animal of any size can get underneath that. Uh, there are some currently existing under road culverts that are in dire need of maintenance because the city of Hamilton didn't actually know that they were there until we pointed them out to them because of mapping and administration and, and et cetera. So I'd, in an ideal world, those would be retrofitted to allow for more easy turtle movement because there's a lot of different features and parameters that are necessary for the animals to want to use them. You can't just put something there. It has to be something they'll wanna use. If it's too dark, they might not do it. If the substrate on the bottom isn't the right material, they might not use it. If it's too narrow, then it's only open to certain animals, et cetera. Uh, it'll take a lot more time and effort and support, but uh, currently we are cautiously optimistic about those things moving forward because of the growing knowledge of the importance of eco corridors, uh, leading to the creation of things like the Coots to Escarpment Initiative. Mm -hmm. I'd better stop talking because if you yes. don't stop me, I'll keep going. <laughs> Okay, so the question was, how do we protect the turtles' nests? Like ah, that? I get to answer this one. We do a couple of things. Uh, in an ideal world, we would just cover all of them and leave them where they are. That would be lovely. Sometimes that's not feasible. A lot of the ones that we have that are laid get laid in areas like busy garden beds or service roads or something like that where it wouldn't be safe for them to stay. In those cases, we can relocate them or we can take them for incubation. There's different options that way. Um, the Blanding's turtles themselves, because we do send them for the head starting program, those are ones that we always collect ourselves um, so that we can send those ones along. So there's a few different options for you. Okay, so the question is, if you see a turtle out on a walk or something near RBG, is there a phone number that you would call? Would you like to answer that one as well? No, nah, you go. No? <laughs> uh, yes, there is, actually. Uh, so what we've been trialing in the past few years is what has become a de facto telephone game of uh, when people see a turtle, we ask folks via social media or uh, printouts and on our website, we ask people to please report it. They can report it to RBG's Facebook page, our Twitter, our Instagram. Of course, we ask that people not post it publicly to the page because we have issues with poaching. People will steal the eggs and the turtles themselves for uh, the black market food and pet trade. Uh, so we ask people that they send their messages privately to those pages. You can also call RBG's main line. This is what we've done in the past. I, I'm hoping we'll be able to continue that. Uh, and our awesome front desk staff will relay the messages to the RBG SAR team via radio or phone. So uh, that way we're able to triage and respond uh, what we go to. Of course, if you are seeing one and you're out on a walk and you happen by an RBG volunteer or staff member, you can definitely please report it to them and they'll be able to contact us uh, via radio as well. And that's uh, and if it's a non-urgent report, sometimes people are welcome to submit it by email, but I, I generally she don't have the check time. Her email I that much. We don't have time during the turtle nesting season to check email, so generally live reports are requested. Oh yes. Okay. So question from online. Uh, question was: Has Shimmy been returned to Long Point or not? It was my first desire to return him to where he was stolen from uh, through discussions with Scott Gillingwater, who is a turtle conservation god who works for the Upper Thames River Conservation Authority, the UTRCA in the London area. Uh, he's the fellow who has been uh, taking over a lot of the studies of turtles in Long Point and the surrounding region. And he and I discussed the pros and cons of relocating Shimmy back to his wetland, and it was decided that Shimmy had already been uprooted once. Uh, and that if we were to return him back to Long Point, the area that Scott knew that he was from has changed drastically due to invasive species. 
as well as not just the uh, invasion of the species, but also their management. So uh, they felt that, and, we, and I agreed that he's so far survived here for at least 10 years. Uh, where we have found him, he's close to some ladies if he feels like exercising anything. <laughs> and uh, he's been able to, he's found a suitable overwintering habitat and he's been able to survive. And plus there's also the issue, this is one of the other reasons why we ask people not to relocate turtles to different wetlands, is the possibility of disease transmission. So ranavirus has been confirmed here at RBG. Um, it was the first spot in Canada, actually, to have had the pathogen confirmed to have killed turtles, and it has also recently been confirmed at Long Point, and you don't want to be helping spread things around. It could be a different, there's multiple different strains of ranavirus, and he could have already survived a strain, but if you move him there and he infects something else, you don't know that they're immune to it, et cetera, et cetera. It's the same thing as moving people around. I mean, we're in the middle of a, ostensibly in the middle of a pandemic, that is possibly over, but it's... Where people go, where, creature, where critters go, pathogens can go as well. So mm -hmm. safer to keep things where they are. Yes. I believe we're being told to wrap it up. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. Can I repeat the question? I did not hear that question. Oh. Um, the question was, what does an undisturbed turtle nest look like? Do you want to answer that? Uh, it depends on the turtle. Snapping turtle nests are a lot easier to see. They make a bit more of a mess than the other ones. They leave uh, what we affectionately call sand boobs, um, <laughs> which is essentially two little mounds that are there. Uh, that's kind of how you can locate a snapping turtle nest. The other ones, you're really not going to find it unless you actually saw the turtle laying their nest. Uh, they cover their tracks a lot, a lot better. So if you see the turtle directly, probably know that it's going to be right in that area. If not, Good luck finding it. Yeah, it's one of the things that we ask for when people submit reports of a turtle that is on land at RBG, because we don't want reports of turtles in water. We want re reports of turtles on land, because that's when they're coming up to nest, typically. And the more details we get, especially when people submit photos, we can often look and say, oh, it's nesting, or oh, it's just walking around. And the photos help us find the nest later, because a lot of the species, they hide it very well. Yes. Okay. okay. I think we have to we leave, have to now. leave now. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks, folks. Thank you. Another wonderful job and an excellent question on eco corridors. That is a hot topic, good topic, topic moving forward. And of course, it's break. We'll be able to have snacks, bathroom, chat more with Sarah or whoever, uh, Lauren, etc. Um, and obviously, we get into some crazy things in this world we live in in this region to make things happen. My eco corridors comment. Um, the short term is provincially, there is a system for highways. And so when you rebuild them, you do something for those. Um, most of the highways got dumped over to the municipalities. They haven't figured that out, all of them at all. Hamilton is on the edge of it. Um, there will be open houses coming soon for a thing called the Hamilton Biodiversity Action Plan. One of the things has to be eco-corridors, and once it's part of that system, thus you would have to attend those open houses and say, give me that. Um, coming soon, months away for sure. Um, then when work, highway work gets done, road work in the city, municipality-owned roads, that gets incorporated. So, break. All right, I think everybody's reasonably settled and online we're working. Thumbs up from Tristan online we're working. Yes, we are, all is good. So, we're shifting from the, the watery side to the land side where we have marvelous old forests, but Forests are also the one that's slowly coming apart, so that it's less fun that way. Um, at the same time, they still are our forests, and uh, we're working on some things beside the forests, in the forests, and all manner of connection. We are gonna give you three presentations. First one is by Joanne Hamilton, who is an intern working on the lands with our following two presenters. And uh, she has a passion for birds, so we slid her in the birds' direction because we of course, have migratory birds all over the place, breeding birds, a lot of birds. How do we sum it all up? And we'll see the story. So over to you, Joanne. I have a very tough act to follow. I have to follow turtles and snack, but I'm hoping that birds will be enough to keep you interested. So as Ty said, my name is Joanne Hamilton. Um, I have a passion for birds, and I've been studying birds for a long time. And as part of my internship, I reviewed 13 years of breeding bird data at RBG, and I'm here to present to you some of the trends that we found while looking at the data. 
So I'm just gonna do a quick overview here. So we're just gonna do the purpose of why we do breeding bird surveys at RBG, the methods that we use uh, for our surveys, our most common species that we have here at RBG, some key takeaways from the data that we analyzed, um, some interesting research on the impact of invasive honeysuckle on our birds, and a celebratory thank you to Lawn Watch. So, a uh, quick overview, um, RBG provides critical breeding and migratory stopover habitat for over 200 species of birds. Um, it's important, it's designated as an important bird area, it's home to many different endangered and at-risk species. Um, and the purpose of our breeding bird surveys was actually to assess the impact of BTK sprays on our breeding bird and forest health. So for those of you who don't know, BTK is our pesticide that is used to control spongy moth. Um, during outbreak years, it can completely defoliate trees and uh, BTK is a known pesticide to deal with this problem. But we also wanted to make sure it wasn't impacting our breeding birds. Over time, as we were doing monitoring, we extended this out to monitor mo uh, multiple terrestrial habitats, so not just our forests, but also our edge habitats and our grasslands. So um, for our methods, we do everything during the month of June, which is peak breeding season and past the migratory uh, shoulder season. We visit 30 sites across the property, um, averaging about 15% of all the terrestrial habitat on the property. So we don't include wetlands and we don't include open water. We use the Ontario Breeding Bird Atlas protocols for survey conditions and timing. And as you can see here on our screen, uh, we kind of just, everything within a 100 meter radius, we re, um, we record anything we see or hear and record any breeding ev evidence. And we visit each site four times so we have a good overview of the species richness present. So what are our most common birds at RBG? Well, we have a lot of the regular birds. So. Um, 52% of all the species we have detected, which is 118, are these 10 birds. Um, as you can see, the red-winged blackbird is ubiquitous across the property, very noisy bird. Um, not only loves wetlands, but also grasslands and kind of any open parkland habitat. We've even seen them in interior forests at times um, through flyovers. Um, 55 species of these 118 um, average less than 1% relative abundance. So they're pretty rare on the property, um, but we're happy to have them nonetheless. And then of course, um, the remaining nine species are pretty common and most people are familiar with them. Most of them visit your backyard feeders or you can find them in parklands, excluding the yellow warbler and red-eyed vireo. So after looking at 13 years of breeding bird data, which was a task, um, the avian, there are some key takeaways that we found in the data. Notably that despite all of the forest health impacts, that the avian community has shown remarkable resilience to change. Um, we also don't have any current evidence that BTK application is negatively affecting our breeding birds at the population level. Um, our grassland restoration efforts have been highly successful in bringing in species at risk. Um, the only, one of the, I guess the bad side is that our interior forest birds are still incredibly vulnerable and we need to continue efforts to protect and restore our interior forest. So I'm gonna briefly talk about resiliency and what the avian community, and how the avian community shows it. So um, ecological resilience is the ability for an ecosystem to recover after significant losses. And the breeding bird community has experienced significant losses in their habitat notably. So with the impact of the emerald ash borer wiping out the ash trees, spongy moth and drought causing forest health stresses, and invasive plant species affecting the understory, the avian community has had to deal with a lot of challenges to their, habit their nesting habitat and their forage, so what they're able to eat. Despite these challenges, the diversity of the species at RBG, the species richness at RBG, and the number of birds that we're detecting each year has been going up all across the property. So we're gonna quickly look at species richness. So species richness is in this yellow orange line and that is just the number of species we detect each year. So on average, we detect 73 breeding bird species a year. Um, so in 2022, we had 77, which was great. And detections are just the number of uh, birds that we hear when we go out for our surveys. So that's also been trending upwards since 2010, which has been phenomenal. Um, diversity, as you can see, is slowly trending upwards. Um, diversity is both the species richness, so number of species, and the evenness of those species. So evenness is kind of the percent chance that you would have to find that species. So if you had 100 species and they were each at one, you have a 1% chance of finding them, but they're all equal, so it's more diverse than if you had 100 of one species um, and 10 of, 10 of different ones at the end. Anyways, if that makes sense. More even, is, more even is better than less even. 
Um, our current value of 3.35 to about 3.65 for the diversity index is considered to be good for terrestrial habitats, specifically terrestrial forest habitats. Um, and we're always happy to see it increasing. Um, and this increase in both species richness, detections, and diversity shows that the avian community has been able to respond to these forest changes, it's been able to adapt, um, and the species that are here are both, there's more species coming into the habitat, and the species that were in the habitat are staying. And now to go on to the impacts of BTK. So again, to reiterate, it's a pesticide to control spongy moth. Spongy moth causes complete defoliation and in multiple years of outbreak can kill multiple trees. Um, so we spray when we have severe outbreaks and we also try to mitigate the effect to breeding birds by only spraying part of the property each year. So we don't spray the entire property and we don't spray um, the same spot multiple years in a row. Um, so that is another benefit to the breeding birds. Um, you can see that I use foliage gleaners. So foliage gleaners are a class of birds that pick insects off of like twigs, branches, leaves, and that's what they use when they're feeding or during migration. And so because BTK kills caterpillars that lives on those twigs and leaves, they're an excellent indicator of their impacts. So we can see here that foliage gleaners have been slowly going up with a very tiny dip after the sprays in 2021 and 2022. We'll see, but that population will likely recover in 2023. Um, just to further reiterate, um, in other research um, that hasn't been done at RBG, but with other species such as cuckoo, cuckoos or red iverios, which rely on caterpillars, they have found that the only impact is that year's nesting, but that there's no long-term population damage. And another piece of good news, excellent news actually, is our grassland restora restoration efforts. So we have 75 hectares of grasslands at RBG and 45 are actively managed. And this is fantastic for a lot of species at risk because they're really picky and they want a lot, they want so much land for tiny territories. It's kind of ridiculous sometimes, especially the bobblings, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, but the, with this management, um, the, we have seen an increase in grassland obligate species and species at risk. So on to the bobblings, my favorite bird. They sound like R2-D2. If you haven't heard it, you need to listen to it. So, bobolinks are picky. They need 10 hectares of grassland before they'll have one territory that is 0.5 hectares. So, they want a lot of space. <laughs> Part of this is because they're really sensitive to edge predators. So your raccoons, your foxes, people, dogs, they don't like that stuff near them. So they try and nest as far away from the edges as possible. In 2017, we restored about 20 hectares of grassland at a new site. And you can see that between 2017 and 2020, it took a while for the bobolinks to show up. And this is known as lag time in restoration. So you will store a site, and then there's usually a period of time before the vertebrates, especially species at risk, find it and then colonize it. But you can see that once they did, they're really happy with it. So we're continuing these efforts and we're hoping to find new species at risk in the future, such as the Eastern Meadowlark and the Grasshopper Sparrow. So stay tuned. Now on to the stuff that's not so great, and that's the interior forest birds. So interior forest birds have low representation at the property. Only 5% of all the birds we detect here are interior forest birds. Um, a quick definition of interior forest, it's any forest that is um, 100 meters or 300 feet away from disturbances such as trails, roads, hydro corridors, et cetera. So it's pretty rare here in Southern Ontario. There's a lot of cuts through our forests Interior forest is really important for these species because they're really sensitive to edge effects. So that's your predators, that's your parasites like the brown-headed cowbird. Um, they're sensitive to people. They don't like people as much as some other, they can't tolerate people and so they won't nest near them. Um, and also interior forests have different uh, climate compared to edge habitats. They can be cooler, they can, be, they can have more humidity, they can have more insects. And so they need that interior forest to thrive. Um, with our current invasive species, with invasive species such as, am yep, oh, sorry. <laughs> with invasive species, um, the, the forest has been changing and so there are threats to our uh, interior forest birds through fragmentation. One such bird is the wood thrush, which has an absolutely gorgeous song. It is entirely reliant on interior forests and super sensitive to human disturbance. Um, we kind of use it as a way, as a metric to measure how the interior forest is doing. 
So if you look at this graph here, Hendry Valley, which is represented by HV, and uh, the South Shore, which is represented by CPSS, um, both don't have any interior forest and a lot of human disturbance and don't have any wood thrush as a result. Um, our North Shore and our escarpment properties only have some wood thrush and we're hoping to restore that as quickly as possible. So um, quickly touching on the South Shore is wood thrush in Churchill Park. Currently there's only 0.2 hectares of interior forest on the South Shore and that is not enough to support any interior forest species, let alone wood thrush. So we are reforesting parts of Churchill Park. I'm sure um, if you've been in the area or you're familiar with this extensive effort that we're doing to reforest massive parts of the park. Um, and we're also, there is some trail closure to mitigate the impact of humans in the area. And we're going to ideally increase the amount of interior forest from 0.2 hectares to 3.5 hectares and bring back the wood thrush. And I'm just gonna quickly touch on honeysuckle and the avian community. So this was found in our research when looking at the impacts of invasive species. So um, inv honeysuckle is an invasive ornamental plant that's been brought over from Eurasia. Um, it provides poor forage, so it doesn't provide very nutritious food, poor habitat, so birds uh, nesting in it don't fare as well, but we are doing something and something can be done about it. So for forage, um, honeysuckle berries in particular are like candy rather than a well-balanced meal. Um, so the birds need to eat a lot of them to get the same amount of nutrients that they would if they ate our native berries. This means more foraging trips to the bushes, which means less time spent at the nest, less time spent resting during migration, less time spent doing other things they need to do because they're spending so much trying to find food. And that also increases their risk to predators because they're out and about more. Um, birds are also extremely opportunistic. So if they see the berries, they will eat them. And it's not indicative that they prefer them or that they don't like them. It's just that's what's available. If all they have is honeysuckle, that's what they eat. And so we remove honeysuckle and plant in native species to change what they have available to them. Um, and then we have nesting. Um, there's been extensive research from other organizations that have looked at the impact of honeysuckle on nesting birds. So they actually found that the nesting success of cardinals, um, American robins, and wood thrush all drastically declined when there was thickets of honeysuckle. This is because when birds nest in honeysuckle, they're more susceptible to predation. Um, they nest lower to the ground, so predators are more able to access them. The, the branching pattern of the honeysuckle is more open. And interestingly, there's also the search image. So what that is, is that there's a whole thicket of honeysuckle. There's nothing else to break up the pattern. The predator learns the trick of how to find the nest. And then they can go nest, 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 nest. Every time that a bird puts a nest into it, they can find it. And so they actually saw drastic decreases in nesting success for cardinals specifically. This has been likened to an ecological trap. For whatever reason, cardinals love to nest in honeysuckle. They see the branching pattern. They see they, they leaves out earlier than all of our other shrubs and they think that's a great spot. I can hide in there. They nest there and then they have the lowest nesting success. But what are we doing about it? Well, we have fantastic volunteers and we have fantastic staff which are hard at work to remove um, this invasive honeysuckle from our property. We mostly do manual removal in the fall and we do some herbicide work when necessary. Um, to remove these giant walls, um, we would not be able to remove nearly as much as we had without our volunteers. Our biodiversity guardians and our volunteers have done so much for us to get rid of honeysuckle and just improve our forests, both interior and edge, to help all of these different breeding species. Um, if you do have any honeysuckle in your yard, please remove it and plant it with something native like a wonderful dogwood, which will provide um, abundant habitat and forage for many different species. I cannot stress enough thank you to the volunteers. Like, there's, just been, there's so much work to do and you guys do so much. <laughs> it's just so much. And um, I wanna be, say a big thank you to Lawn Watch. Um, this is another part of my project which I'm working on a report on right now. Um, they've been doing migratory bird transects since 2015. 2014, my bad, sorry. Um, the transect surveys are done on the North Shore and Hendry Valley um, in the spring and summer, uh, spring and fall months um, during peak migration season. Um, the volunteers record all birds they see or hear along 25 kilometers of transects, which is pretty impressive um, across, you know, Cherry Hill, uh, Captain Cooch, tra uh, the Anishinaabe Trail, I should say, and Grado. Um, this year alone, they dedicated 529 hours of effort and did 230 transects for us, which is insane. They detected 103, uh, 173 species on the property and they had, they had 83,000 birds that they saw. 
it's impressive. We're hoping that with the report finishing up that we'll have more long-term trend data to share with you in the future. Thank you for watching. <laughs> Marvelous, marvelous, marvelous. Um, questions, a couple of quick ones before we move on. Any? Avian influenza is more of an issue for waterfowl than it is for forest birds because of how waterfowl intermingle with domestic stock. So avian influenza is typically found in your swans, ducks, and geese. Thankfully, with the re most recent outbreak, we did not see significant impacts to the wild bird population. Thank you. Any other questions? Excellent. Yeah, thank, thank you very you, much. Thank you, Joanne. Marvelous. <laughs> Marvelous. It's a lot there. There's a lot there. And of course, the thing that I really wanted when I became head of natural areas was I want scientific facts. So I really know what's going on in the world because people say a lot of things about a lot of things. I used to think the birds were disappearing. More broadly, they are because they're missing habitat. But if you have a habitat, you might actually have birds. And they might even be going up. We had a lot of habitat to fix. Looks like we're doing the right things there. Um, another interesting note, which you might not have picked up from the graph, but our friend the wood thrush with the brilliant song, on the South Shore Forest, remember when we were all locked in our houses in COVID? Wood thrush appeared on the South Shore Forest that year because they were no longer chased away. So they're around, they're looking for space. On to our next one. Surely we have Miss Mallory Pierce up here. Uh, she's the assistant terrestrial ecologist. One time she was an intern even. Before that here, she is a girl from Trent University, but a Hamilton girl. She's a big fan of the tiger cats, I find. <laughs> and we'll bring her up here. We're doing the South Shore? North Shore? Okay, North. Oh, sorry. That's good. So, um, what we're going to tell you, what she's going to tell you, is the big forest area that is the North Shore Forest, which happens to have the interior forest on it. How's it doing? Sorry, Joanne, I'm taller than you, so I need to adjust. All right, um, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Mallory, as Ty said. I'm the Assistant Terrestrial Ecologist at RBG. Um, I know it's getting late, so I'll try and uh, blast through this real quick. It's approaching my bedtime, so I apologize if I doze off here. Um, but like Ty said, I'm gonna be talking about the North Shore Forest and kind of what went on there this year. And I added lots of animations so that you'll stay engaged. <laughs> uh, so just a quick overview of what I'm gonna be talking about this evening. Um, I'm gonna give a quick description and the features of the North Shore Forest, what makes it kind of special. Um, some of the current threats that it's facing, which monitoring goes on there and what we found this year. And the invasive species management that's been going on across the property, as well as trying to predict the future of the forest. Gonna try and look into that crystal vault ball and see what the heck could be coming our way. So for those of you that may have not been to the North Shore Forest, um, it's a, probably about a four minute drive west of here. Um, you can see on the map, we are located at RBG Center, which is um, the red star on the map there. Um, and then the North Shore Forest is highlighted in the yellow circle. Um, it has 9.7 kilometers of trails. It's also our largest nature sanctuary. But it's also important to keep in mind that it is an urban forest. Even though we might go out there and we think that we're you know, somewhere far up north because it's this nice protected piece of land, it still has all the impacts of being an urban forest. Uh, so if you're out on any given day on the North Shore Forest, you might come across some interesting finds. Um, anything from hemlocks to northern red oaks, white-tailed deer, trout lily, mayapple, trilliums, house wrens, and as Joanne just mentioned, the wood thrush. And of course, thousands of other species in between. So currently, the land use on the North Shore Forest has a wide range and is quite varied season to season, and even day to day. Uh, there's a wide variety of activities that occur, such as educational programming that's run by RBG staff, 
uh, significant archaeological research has been done on the property, as well as more passive recreational use like hiking and photography, restoration projects, and scientific monitoring, just to name a few. So this is probably a common theme throughout the whole night, but some of the current threats to the forested ecosystem on the North Shore, um, despite it being a large uh, expanse of undeveloped land, it doesn't mean it's um, kind of immune to these threats. So one of the biggest threats to the North Shore forest is invasive plants, and some that we've been working on, as Joanne mentioned, uh, quite intensively over the last few years. Um, some of the most popular, I guess if you want to put it that way, invasive species on the North Shore forest are garlic mustard, which you can see at the bottom right-hand side, um, dog strangling vine, which is right above it, uh, Amur honeysuckle, which Joanne just spoke about in the bird presentation. This is actually working out quite well. You can tie them up closely. Um, which you can see above the snake picture there, a nice thicket of honeysuckle and common buckthorn. Um, and then in addition to invasive species kind of wreaking havoc on the North Shore, um, there's also the increase of recreational use, especially during COVID when we weren't in lockdown times, our trails were completely packed with visitors. And that's a good thing, but it also has uh, ecological impacts such as increased compaction on the trails, which increases runoff. Um, and also, sorry, ooh, ah, no, <laughs> go back. Okay, it does go back, this is good. There we go. Uh, increased runoff and also can lead to increase of um, potentially foraging of plants and wildlife, um, and poaching of wildlife, I guess. Um, and also, like I mentioned earlier, it is an urban forest, the North Shore is, and it's completely surrounded on three sides uh, by roads, railways, and uh, that can increase the chance of roadkill because wildlife don't understand property boundaries and that they're safe on RBG property, so they will wander off onto roads. So if only we could teach them. Um, so then some of the monitoring that occurs on the North Shore by the terrestrial ecology team are breeding bird surveys, which Joanne just spoke about, forest monitoring, and spongy moth surveys. And I'll be talking about the last two in this presentation. So jumping right into forest monitoring, um, for more than a decade, RBG has conducted long-term forest monitoring across all four nature sanctuaries. There are currently 14 permanent forest monitoring plots across the property, and five of these, as you can see on the map on the slide, uh, occur on the North Shore. So what exactly is a plot? Now I'll go through this because it's a little bit confusing. Um, so we have each plot is 20 by 20 meters, and the dark green circles indicate a two meter by two meter regeneration subplot. So that's where we go in and we measure all the trees under 200 centimeters and identify them to species. The light green squares at the bottom of the 20 by 20 plot, uh, these are our one by one meter vegetation monitoring plots. And that's where we go in and we identify, or to the best of our ability, everything in those plots and everything is counted. Throughout the 20 by 20 meter plot, all trees over 10 centimeters DBH are identified, counted, and tagged, and we track their health over time. And finally, for the entire plot, a complete species list is identified and their percent cover or how much physical space they're taking up in the plot is also recorded. So here's just a picture of us having fun in the forest. Um, so a lot of our time is spent finding these plots in the forest because some of our markers move year to year. So there we are with our long measuring tape, measuring out 20 meters. And you can see Joanne and Lindsay there, um, they're doing our vegetation surveys. So moving into some of the results from our monitoring program this year, or sorry, last year, 2022, um, looking at the canopy trees, the most abundant tree was the red maple, followed by uh, black cherry and then red oak. There were a total of 75 living trees that were identified and tagged in all five monitoring plots. And we're very happy to say that of those 75 trees, we found 14 species and they were all native species. So there are no non-native trees in our plots this year, which is awesome. 
So the great thing about long-term monitoring is that you can look back in history and kind of compare and see how things are changing. So this table shows uh, the species, all tree species identified in the canopy layer in 2012 and 2022, and how their associated relative cover, which is just the space that they take up, has changed over time. So I don't think it's a surprise to any ecologist or naturalist in the room that uh, the two trees that had the largest decline in, those, in that 10 year span was green ash and white ash. And this is due to the emerald ash borer coming in and completely decimating the population. Um, and interestingly, another species that has also dropped its relative cover is the white oak. Um, there could be multiple reasons for it, but I think the working theory right now is that some of the larger oaks have possibly died out and we're recruiting younger, smaller oaks. So the physical space that they're taking up is less than those larger trees that could have died out in the past. Um, and then looking at trees that are actually on the incline, which this is a good thing, um, we're looking at things like the Northern Red Oak and black oak. So those two are on the rise here. And then everything else is kind of remaining similar-ish in terms of their relative cover. Looking at the shrub layer, um, this is considered to be 0 0.5 meters off the ground to 10 meters in height. Sorry, I'm not a foot person, I do meters. Um, and there has been a drastic change in the shrub community in the last 10 years. So you can see in 2012, American witch hazel was the most abundant shrub, taking about 15% of all space on the forest monitoring plots. But that has completely been bumped out of first place in 2022 by the non-native honeysuckle, which now accounts for about 40% of all the space um, in our forest monitoring plots in the shrub layer. And you can see that we've actually lost a lot of species too, and the species richness has gone from 38 in 2012 to 22. This is possibly due to the honeysuckle completely taking over and decimating one plot in particular. So looking at the ground vegetation, what's on the forest floor, um, the most abundant plant in the forest floor was Canada clearweed. Now there's a caveat to this because one plot was completely covered in Canada clearweed. This is a native plant, it's an annual, tends to be a bit of an aggressive reseeder when it's happy. Um, I'll talk about that in a minute. And then uh, we're looking at green ash, white ash, black raspberry, and honeysuckle, non-native honeysuckle rounding out the top five, and all the other species added up for about 50% of our um, cover there. So Canada clearweed, aggressive reseeder, possibly is loving its conditions due to ash dieback, allows more light to the forest floor, um, typically, this is an invitation for invasive species to come in. However, this can of clear weed is clearly just loving it at gray dough. Looking at garlic mustard here, um, this is an invasive that has been a thorn in our side for quite a while. However, we have noticed that uh, garlic mustard trend is trending downward actually on both the South Shore and North Shore properties. I'm um, not quite sure the reason for this other than there have been a few studies that have come out that said once garlic mustard kind of peaks, it almost outcompetes itself and can kind of start dying out. So this is a good thing. We haven't been managing these plots in particular. These are kind of a no touchy zone plot. So we'll just have to wait and see what happens with the, with the garlic mustard. All in all, it's a good thing. Talking about invasives more, um, Joanne had mentioned that we have amazing volunteers that come help us remove invasive shrubs, mostly in the fall because it's not so hot and it's hard work. Um, so last year, we actually removed about 20,000 invasive shrubs across the entirety of the North Shore Forest. Um, not just anybody's surprise, I don't think that the largest amount removed was actually Amir Honeysuckle. Um, and we had over 500 volunteer hours dedicated to this project as well. So that was over the course of a few months and you can see it's almost double the amount of hours that staff put in. So that's awesome. Uh, okay, this is kind of a big topic here, spongy moth. Uh, if you are in the naturalist community or even reading the newspapers, you'll see that we have kind of passed the peak of spongy moth outbreak in Ontario. Uh, it's a non-native caterpillar moth species that completely has the opportunity to defoliate oaks, cherries, maples, and birches. 
Um, so in 2020 and 2021, nearly our, all of RBG's nature sanctuaries experienced severe levels of defoliation. Um, and we knew that something needed to be done because studies have shown that year over year defoliation by spongy moth can actually cause the death of trees. And we have a lot of trees, so we need to keep them healthy. Um, so we had taken up extra monitoring plots and found out that, look at the North Shore is forecasted to have very severe defoliation across the property uh, for 2022. You'll see that the South Shore right below uh, the North Shore there is all green, and that's because we sprayed and treated spongy moth caterpillar in 2021. So we knew something needed to be done. So the way that you can treat for spongy moth, you can treat individually per tree. However, we have thousands of trees in our forest, so that is not the best option. Um, so for a large scale spray, we hired a contractor, Zimmer Air, who flies a helicopter and sprays pesticide out of it onto the trees. Um, so this required a lot of background work, um, coordination with municipalities, staff, um, and the contractor that was led by Lindsay Barr. So big shout out to Lindsay for making this all happen, a huge operation. Um, and it required a lot of staff work too. So thanks to all the staff that made that possible. I do have a quick video to show you. I'm hoping it worked. It worked when I practiced. So this is just a video of the helicopter going over, spraying the BTK onto the trees and um, applying the pesticide early in the morning too. So you can kind of see the lines coming out of the helicopter there. Um, they do this at five in the morning. So that means that we need to be on site for four in the morning, which made for some early mornings, but also made for some awesome photography of helicopters going over. So, oh, it's gonna play again for you. So this is just an example, even though this picture was taken in 2021, uh, like I said, we sprayed a different part of the property in 2021, but you can see on your left-hand side that those trees, those are oak trees, completely defoliated by spongy moth caterpillars in 2021. They did not have any treatment that year. The photo on the right-hand side is an oak tree on the south shore of Coots Paradise, and that tree had BTK sprayed on it, and you can see it still has all of its leaves fully intact, so that is a tree that is not stressed. So this is, just shows the importance of the need to spray and try and get ahead of these caterpillars and protect the ecological integrity of, of the trees. Okay, so I did promise like a crystal ball look into the future. We don't know what the future holds. Um, unfortunately, we'd love to predict what's coming our way, but um, we do, because the ecological community, the naturalist community, there's such a wide range of communication that we can kind of see how things are going and know what's coming our way. So as we all know, climate change is already here um, in Ontario, but it probably can and will change. So it'll be interesting to see how the forest community adapts, changes, and hopefully persists over time. Um, and then there are two two things that we're kind of looking for that are currently in Ontario, but not confirmed on RBG property. And this is hemlock woolly adelgid and any new invasive plant species um, such as Japanese stilt grass. And then there are a few different species that are kind of knocking at the door. They're not quite in Ontario yet, but in the next decade or so, um, they could be here. Things such as oak wilt, chronic wasting disease, and spotted lanternfly. I didn't want to end on a gloomy note, but I'm sorry. <laughs> See, told you I'd keep it fun. Um, so thank you all for listening, and a special thanks to Lindsay, Joanne, Tice, and all of RBG's volunteers. Uh, Joanne expressed it earlier. We would not do half the work uh, without the help of our volunteers, and, and they're really a, a big shining star in our department. So thank you. I should turn, there we go, I'm on. We might take two questions, but we'll move it along. Or none, we're getting none, that's fine too. I, I would just say this, BTK, just so you know, because we had to learn a lot more about BTK, because I was looking for alternate ways of doing this. Uh, BTK is actually Bacillus thuringiensis, so it's bacteria. It's bacteria that's in the dirt, it's in the dirt outside, it's normal bacteria. 
bacteria, but caterpillars don't normally chew on it because they're not in the dirt. So what you really do is you brew some bacteria from the dirt, put it in the helicopter, drop it on the top of the tree, and the two don't get along, the caterpillar. Most caterpillars even, not just the, the spongy mod caterpillars. Mm -hmm. Yes, so it falls under the regulated pesticide world at the same time you can go, because it's a bacteria, which is in the soil, which means it's on my shoes, um, you can get it at the hardware store. And so my house was being stripped. I live in Greensville. I got some BDK from home hardware, put it in my pressure washer, fired it up to the top of my oak tree. It's a do-it-yourselfer there. Do-it-yourselfer thing. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, we oh, a good. question. One question. <laughs> So what determines an outbreak is we conduct surveys and we go out in the winter and look at the egg masses. I think I had a picture of it, the uh, little egg masses that are on the tree. So we count that and we predict based on how many egg masses are on a tree, extrapolate that out to a hectare size and then look at, there's certain metrics for, you know, if you're over X number of egg masses per hectare, you're looking at severe defoliation for that year. So it's kind of a buildup of the population over time. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yes. W wonderful, marvelous stuff. Um, I can tell you all that Mallory has given you a glimpse into will be a full report that will appear on our website where other versions for Hendry Valley and the South Shore exist. Um, we're now gonna go to our last one to the mystical term grasslands, which actually means meadow. And Lindsay will speak a little too, little more to it, but it actually d got a national strategy for meadows, grasslands, because that simple thing we take for granted. Hey, Lindsay, yours is not up. <laughs> Darn, that'll take a second. Hmm. Mouse. Where's my pointer? A national strategy called Grasslands National Strategy. We followed with it. We had some odds and ends of property. We didn't really used to have grasslands because most meadows get taken for granted and become something else. Um, we now have a bunch of grasslands. Lindsay's gonna tell you about them. They're new, shiny and new. Lindsay, terrestrial ecologist, been here since 2007, was also one of these interns at one time. Um, it's taken the reins of all sorts of things, but the lands, which are a big area, and all of the challenges. Um, doing a wonderful job, as you can see. Brilliant interns, brilliant everybody. There you are, grasslands. Mouse is jumpy. Where'd you go? Okay. All right, thank you everyone. We're in the home stretch, I promise. Um, I'm here to talk to you today about our RBG's grassland conservation and restoration work. Okay, so for the overview, um, you're gonna learn what a grassland is and why they're important. Um, I'm gonna provide a few grassland restoration updates as well as our monitoring results. And again, we look at plants, birds, and butterflies for grasslands. And I'm gonna hint on a couple projects, upcoming projects that we'll have in uh, 2023. So first of all, what is a grassland? Grasslands are typically made up of native grasses and wildflowers, um, and they contain little to no tree cover. Um, they maintain their open state by experiencing some kind of disturbance. So that could be fire, it could be grazing, flooding, or drought. And we have three types of grasslands, I guess you could say, in, at RBG. Um, one of them is an oak savanna, which is essentially a grassland with a few scattered oak trees in it. Um, a tall grass prairie, and a tall grass prairie is actually, um, has more grasses than wildflowers. Um, and it typically grows on well-drained and sandy soils. A meadow, on the other hand, can be any type of grassland, but is typically higher percentage of wildflowers versus grasses, and it can develop on multiple different types of soil and drainage. 
So grasslands are important because they support an incredible amount of biodiversity. 33% um, of Ontario species at risk rely on grassland habitat. And grasslands also provide an enormous amount of ecosystem services to us as well. Um, they, that includes climate regulation, carbon sequestration, erosion control, and they improve air quality, and that's just to name a few. So grasslands are under threat. Uh, the biggest one, of course, was habitat loss and fragmentation. We lost about 99% of our grasslands during, in this region during European settlement. And of course, invasive species are always on this list. Um, and also, I, I'll say the lack of beneficial disturbance. So that beneficial disturbance is wildfire, as well as um, like the flooding and the grazing that I talked about. Um, so without the proper land management, um, though that lack of disturbance can actually foster more invasive species to come in. And that's, uh, so when I talk about non-beneficial disturbance, that's foot traffic and compaction, and we have a big problem at Princess Point with this. Um, so there's people who walk off trail, that compacts the soil, it favors the growth of non-native grasses, and then the cycle continues. Um, and as well, climate change, as we know, is a big threat to our ecosystems. We're still trying to understand what that means for grasslands. But for example, if we're getting more precipitation, less, less dry conditions, do I have to be closer? <laughs> um, it, it could change the dynamics of the vegetation community. So here are some of our grasslands at RBG. We contain well over 70 hectares of grasslands and our conservation projects are focusing on managing 45 hectares. So the grasslands I'm gonna to talk to you about today are at Princess Point, they're the ones highlighted in white, Berry Track South and Monarch Meadow up at Rock Chapel Conservation Area. So first of all, Princess Point. This has basically been working on Princess Point my entire career at RBG. Um, over the last 15 years, we've been transforming the fields into tall grass prairie. Um, and we, our key management tool for Princess Point is using fire um, and controlled burns to manage invasive species and woody vegetation from overtaking the site. Um, so we use burns and manual removal and Herbicide use sometimes to uh, manage some of the non-native invasive shrubs. And um, we focus our efforts on planting and seeding native vegetation to reintroduce um, our native species to, uh, is this, okay, I'm gonna try this one. Okay, can you hear me better now? Is it the way I'm talking? Okay, sorry guys. Um, so to control some of the people who are um, visiting Princess Point and to help them stay on the trail, we've also um, done some trail system enhancements like lookouts to try and keep them in certain areas and off others. So fire is, an effect, is effective at managing grassland ecosystems because it favors tall grass prairie species and impedes the growth of non-native grasses and woody vegetation. So here's an example of one of our burns. After the burn, you can see that the soil's blackened, it provides, it absorbs sunlight, it provides nice um, open areas for our plants to germinate, our native plants. And only a couple weeks after the burn, we can see that the area is greening up quite nicely. And only a couple months after that, the vegetation is now almost a meter tall. And then after that, this is later in the growing season, we have our tall grasses that can reach up to two meters tall. And this is what Princess Point looked like in 2009. And this is what Princess Point looks like 12 years later. So now I'm gonna move on to talk about some of our escarpment properties. In 2017, we be began to focus grassland conservation efforts here, creating 35 hectares of meadow habitat. And this was on old um, agricultural land. Most of the sites were treated with herbicide prior to uh, seeding or seeded directly after the last harvest of the agricultural field. Um, and that's, uh, and seeding native grasses and wildflowers afterwards. And we used farm equipment for that because these areas were so big. So here's a photo of a tractor seeding berry tract south in 2017. 
and we added some wetlands to the site to um, provide water for wildlife and create amphibian ha habitat, as well as reduce the amount of erosion and water movement across the soil. And here's the plant growth at Bear Track South today. We see some lovely flowers are coming up. And our Rock Chapel Monarch Meadow Grassland Restoration. Um, we used the um, St. Williams Nursery and Ecology Center to help us out with this one. They provided an enormous amount of seed for this area and the tractor and the staff to install the seed. And so this is what it looked like one year after restoration. Um, and it was dominated by lamb's quarters and witchgrass. These are common weeds that are typically found in agricultural systems. Um, so we, we found a couple things that germinated from seed that year, but it was mostly um, these non-native species. So we held our breath. And then this year we had, I was amazed by this year, uh, we, it, the meadow was absolutely dominated by native beer tongues and rye grasses. And then as the season kept going, we had, well, um, wild bergamot and uh, black eye Susans, as well as asters and goldenrods. So uh, I'm gonna touch on some monitoring work that we do in our grasslands. Uh, we, do, we do look at plants. Um, we do one by one meter ground vegetation quadrats. We use photo boards to sort of measure the height of the grasses. And we do transects between um, some of our plots to get a sense of what's growing in between. We do our bird point counts, as Joanne covered extensively in her uh, presentation. And we do a butterfly count once a year um, to try and capture a snapshot of what butterflies are using in the grasslands. Okay, I'm gonna get a pointer. So this is Princess Point uh, vegetation monitoring. The light green line on top is the native plant cover, and the dark green line is the non-native plant cover. And the circles that you see below marking the years, those are years that we had a prescribed burn. So um, as you can see, we have crossed the threshold where we have more native plants growing on the site than non-native plants, which is great. So we crossed that threshold after the first few consecutive burns we did. But I wanna note that every year we have a burn, these kind of separate a little bit further apart, but now they're getting close together again. Um, and I think that maybe we need to burn more frequently possibly or find a way to somehow drop that non-native vegetation cover a little bit lower. Um, so I'm gonna move to the next, oops, shoot, hang on. There we go. The next slide, which is um, kind of the same slide but broken up into different species types. So we have our wildflowers, which is the purple line on top. We have our non-native grasses, which is the dark green line in the middle, our non-native forbs or wildflowers, which is this orange line, and then our native grasses down here, which is the light green line. And again, the circles represent the burn years. We really need to try and get the, this native grass line up higher um, because we are trying to manage for a tall grass prairie, has more grasses than wildflowers, right? And then this predominantly green dark green line is the turf grasses. So we definitely do need to get that down as well. We had a really high um, amount of plantain at the beginning, which was controlled very effectively. But now we're seeing a little uptake at the end here, which is marked by cow veg. And another thing that I wanted to note as well is that of our native wildflowers, we do have a lot of goldenrod. Goldenrod's native, it's a great plant, but we do want to create more diversity in that layer. So we want more evenness. So we want more of the other species to be represented as well. So for Berry Trek South, it's, we have only had a couple or three years of data um, gathering. So we're looking at plant cover here as well. Um, and we're seeing that the non-natives are going down and that the native plant cover is going up which is a good sign. And I'm hoping that when we do our monitoring in 2023, that um, these will be opposite. So we will have more native cover than non-native. So time will tell. And here is our success story, our Monarch Meadow at Rock Chapel. 
Um, out of the, so we only had one year that where we've collected data and it was this year, in, well, 2022. And you can see here that we have about 12% cover of non-native plants, followed by, well, and then 7% cover of other, which is things that we couldn't identify two species. But then 37% of the plant cover that we did see in our quadrats was from the seed that we installed on site. And then 45% of that other species cover is actually naturally occurring native uh, native plants. So most of that being um, native goldenrods and asters, which really showed up later in the season. Quickly mentioning um, the birds, I'd like to just note that um, our birds are increasing in our grasslands. We do have more grassland habitat. So before we did our grassland restoration work, we had uh, a fewer species and fewer detections overall of grassland species. And then moving on over time, when we've created more grassland habitat, we're seeing more species and more detections of birds. and to our native butterflies. And I just looking at our native butterflies, I kind of pulled out the non-native butterflies from the numbers. So non-native butterflies would be cabbage whites and European skippers. But here's a little snapshot of Princess Point, Berry Track South and Rock Chapel. And I know these graphs are small, but if you look at the dark green line, that's just the number of native butterflies we counted. And you can see that across all three sites, the number of native butterflies is increasing. And then the lower line is the species richness, so the number of species we count per um, butterfly count. And um, again, it's, it's not moving up as drastically as the others, but we are getting more species as we move forward. Okay, to summarize, overall, our BEG's grasslands are steadily improving. Native plant cover is trending up, while non-native plant cover is trending down at all of our monitored sites. Native butterflies and grassland birds appear to be increasing at RBG with increased grassland habitat. And starting grassland restoration immediately following agriculture years yields the best results as we saw at our Rock Chapel grassland site. As for our future projects, we have a controlled burn planned at Princess Point this spring. Uh, of course, the date is to be determined because the weather will determine when we are able to do so and when the most ideal time is. Continued management of off-trail activity at Princess Point is always on the radar and always an important part of our projects. I think that with prescribed burning in combination with managing off-trail use, that'll be key to the success in increasing native grasses at Princess Point and declining the non-native grasses. So you can kind of see, I wanted to add this picture here. Um, this is where people were, have been going, and I think it's because a lot of people like to take pretty pictures in meadows. Um, and so it, it kind of makes for a, an area that's actually hard to burn as well. So not only are they impacting the vegetation that's growing here, we can't get a good burn to kill off the non-native grasses that are dominating this site. So I'm hoping this year we'll get um, some really good conditions for a strong and hot burn. Um, and then going back up to our grass or our escarpment properties, we're going to be focusing on improving the wetland habitat in these grasslands. Um, down here is um, an example of uh, an area, a wetland area at the Monarch Meadow, the one that's doing very well. We've treated some Phragmites and managrass in that wetland, and it's there's a lot of sediment. As you can see, it doesn't really look like a wetland right now. It's not, um, there's no depression there. Um, we're hoping to remove some of that sediment and recreate a wetland so that it does its job and functions as a proper wetland. I wanted to acknowledge the Ontario Trillium Foundation because their support has been an integral part of this program. Um, without their funding, we wouldn't be able to do any of these grassland projects. Um, and they really were able to take our grassland work and make it bigger and more impactful for, the com for our community as well as the, the wildlife and the pollinators around here. And thank you for staying so long <laughs> tonight. Uh, thank you for sticking it out and listening to me talk about grasslands. I also want to thank my team. 
Of course, the RBG volunteers, we can do anything without their assistance. I want to give a shout out to the Ontario Plant Restoration Alliance who do provide us with some um, assistance and uh, seed for our restoration projects and of course to our donors. Thank you. Do we have time? We might have time for questions. Go ahead, Lexi. That's a good question. Um, so over the long term, we will continue our monitoring work. So our monitoring will really tell us what um, we'll need to do. I predict that there will be some invasive species work in our future. Um, I'm very hopeful that this year, because we had a really wet spring, I think we had a really good germination of native plants. Um, but I think we will see non-native species to creep in. So we're gonna monitor that. We're gonna continue our work doing invasive species management. Yes. So I didn't quite hear all the questions. I got before European settlement, how extensive were the grasslands here? And where were they found? Okay, so Burlington Heights is a great example of where a grassland could have occurred. A lot of um, locations on the top of escarpment, we actually see remnant sites. So we can kind of tell where grasslands were based on some of the indicator species. So the tall grasses like big blue stem and Indian grass and little blue stem, you can find speckled around the, the um, area. So anywhere that's flat, and was developed fairly early on was likely a grassland habitat. And we have wet meadows as well. So um, some, a lot of the lower um, Hamilton region would have been open grassland habitat, but just more wet because it was so close to the harbor. Any other comment? Yeah, I might say where the sandy soil is, it keeps it drier. Um, so there's remnants of a drier plant community, which are grasslands. Of course, there's the odds and ends where a lightning strike started a fire and you get holes in the forest for a while. But where the sandy soils are, which is generally to the west, a little bit around water down, because there's weird, interesting pockets of sand up there. Um, a lot of West Hamilton, Northwest Hamilton, thus Flamborough, is actually a sand plain, connects to a giant sand plain going south to Long Point. And so those are your big grassland areas. Okay, I think we're done. All right. Any more questions? Thank you. I would. <laughs> yes, a, a little uh, current challenge for grasslands that you don't think of is in the world of we, we love our trees, right? We love our trees. Tree reforestation for climate change is now a thing too. That actually means that we keep sticking trees in open areas. Open areas are grasslands. And so we have a distinct group of the property now that's, nope, trees don't get to go there, um, which does remind me of that escarpment question. One of the ways, of course, to keep the trees from growing up is to light them on fire, like Princess Point. We don't actually have light the escarpment on fire plants. <laughs> the other way to keep the trees down is to mow them or cut them down, right? So that is actually what has been going on up at the escarpment. So if you live by the escarpment, there's no plans for big fires in the short term. <laughs> Anyway, that brings us to the end of the evening. And so that is a bunch of marvelous things. We will hopefully be able to post this online so you could look through some of the stories and activities that went on. Um, obviously, some parts of it come on as formal reports on our website. Um, we'll just have to see how big a file this makes because this is quite a thing. Never done one like this before. Um, otherwise, looking forward, I think it's going to be a wonderful year. The sun was shining again today. The sewage is always less flowing to Coots Paradise. It could be zero. That would be wonderful. The water was so low that we essentially cleaned every last carp out, so there will be blocks of just settled, calm, clear water, and it snowed enough to even give us some water after such a drought. So. All looking forward to wonderful things. There will obviously be late nights tracking a Blanding's turtle to be seen. Anyway, thank you for coming, and we'll see you perhaps a year from now. <laughs>